one of the things I'm trying to demonstrate to Chief and to Stray and to Casey is what we do here. These a group of people who are, are the guys I've been looking for since I've been doing this show, who are willing to go out and take these issues to the police. Now, if we can get them to adopt some of these tools that we have, uh, I was telling them, uh, I think they hold the key to the matrix. This matrix that's been developing. We have a police state emerging and it's it's emerged to the point that it's becoming a serious problem. People are really beginning to notice it. But technology has improved to the point that we are able to actually take some action at the bottom. The bottom is is what Everything else is built on top of. If we can destabilize their agenda at the bottom, then everything above it falls apart. thing to him if you don't say nothing okay. i don't know what he's okay. going to do i have done this seven times in court <clears throat> first time was in conroe texas i filed a habeas corpus they stopped a murder trial and the judge said are you mr kelton yes your honor i am are you the one that filed the habeas corpus yes matter of fact i am and the judge said are you an attorney oh no judge i sleep well at night Keep my hands in my own pockets. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, that didn't sit well with him. And he said, well, Mr. Kelton, since you're not an attorney, I'm not going to accept this habeas. I turned to the bailiff. Mr. Bailiff, did you hear that? Yes, Mr. Kelton, I did. Arrest that judge. Oh, I can't arrest a judge. And she sure can. Just go up there and put the cuffs on him and drag him off to jail. You don't have far to go. It's right down in the basement. For about five to seven minutes, we had this back and forth about whether or not the bailiff is going to arrest the judge. I even asked him to take his chicken suit off and told him, do you think that judge would hesitate a minute in throwing you under the bus? So you're going to risk shielding from prosecution charges to protect that judge? Well, I can arrest the judge. When the bailiff absolutely refused... The judge, in the meantime, sat there and kept his mouth shut. He knew, and he knew that I knew. One word out of him, witness tampering, obstruction. I'm making criminal accusations against him. He knew to keep his mouth shut. When the bailiff absolutely refused, the judge picked up the gavel and said, Mr. Bailiff, if Mr. Kelton doesn't leave my courtroom, you're to arrest him. I looked up at the judge and said, with all due respect, Your Honor, that's cheating. He said, maybe, but I got the gavel. Oh, good point. <laughs> point at the bailiff. You, come with me. And I stormed out of the courtroom. That was so much fun. I'm in Weekly County, Tennessee, and they, they won't, won't let you go, you go into, into the court, court with a cell phone. phone. So, so I went to the court, court door. door. And they said, you can't go in with that cell phone. Oh, yeah, but uh, I want to videotape the proceedings. He said, I understand that, but you can't take the cell phone in, in the courtroom. I said to the bailiff, hey, you know that's improper. Yes, I know, but uh, I have to do what the judge says. So, okay, so I go and put it in my, my car, I come back, and now they got the, judge, the door closed. And he, and he said, said I, I can't go, go in the courtroom. courtroom. I, can I can only go, go in the courtroom when they have a recess. Oh, oh, no, no, no. I can go in the courtroom anytime because it's a public court. court. Oh, no, no. I can't let you in. The judge has ordered it. You know that's improper. Yes, I do. But I have to follow the rules. So I filed criminal charges against him. He was very professional, very polite. 
And that's, that's why, why I filed, I filed against him. Because he didn't act ignorant. ignorant. And, and everybody, everybody I filed with, I told him what a great bailiff he was, but he just followed what the judge told him. And they said, well, why didn't you file against the judge? I said, well, the judge didn't block you from the courtroom. The bailiff did. He said, but the judge told him that, too. I said, well, I don't know about that. As far as I'm concerned, that's your say. He blocked me from the courtroom. So I wanted him, as an affirmative defense, to throw the judge under the bus for me. <laughs> I'm still having fun with that one. That was not done yet. Let me ask you a question. You know what corpus delecta is? Yes. Well, just for people that don't know, would you say what that is before I tell you something? Corpus body delecti deceased. Right. Well... The way the attorneys and judges and instructors would tell us that is the body of the evidence or the body of the person. Okay. So <laughs> I had a friend who went to court and so he told the judge or he asked the judge, excuse me, he said, Your Honor, I am pro se. And I, I realize that I do not know all the rules of evidence. I do not know these certain things. But I feel I know my case and myself better than anybody. And I can represent myself better than anybody. The judge cautioned him. He said, I just have a not legal questions, clarification questions. He said, is corpi, cor, corpus delecti, he said, does that mean like, the body like somebody's dead or or somebody actually coming to court and they are the witness and so forth said yes and he said well I think the state of Texas is the corpus delecti and the DA represents them right he says yes he said okay well I want you to compel the corpus delecti of the body to appear in court to swear I did whatever it is you say I did. Because I have a right of cross-examination, is that not correct? I want to cross-examine my accuser. And I, unless you're going to put the district attorney on the stand, and he's going to testify on their behalf and represent himself and represent them. So the judge says, I'm going to consider this matter we're going in recess. Yeah, the prosecutor cannot do that. We have Wilma Kennedy v. State says that we're about to run off the cliff. Hang on, Randy Felton, Brett Bowden, Rula Radio. I'm not going to turn the phone lines on quite yet, and we'll be right back. Okay, we are back. Randy Kelton, Brett Fountain, Wheel of Law Radio, and we're talking to Damon Jones. And when we were going out, I mentioned Wilma V. State. This, we were talking about who is the accuser. The accuser must be a credible person. Those are the only people in every state I've ever been to who are authorized to make a criminal accusation. And while a prosecuting attorney can be a credible person, he cannot be a credible person concerning a case he's prosecuting. <laughs> Wilma V. State said that in order to uh, in order to avoid the obvious evils of the accumulation of power in one office, for the purpose of initiating a, prosec a prosecution, a prosecuting attorney is not a credible person, meaning that the prosecutor cannot be the accuser and the prosecutor. He can be either one, but if he is one, he cannot be the other. Say a prosecutor gets robbed on the way into the courthouse. He can accuse someone of robbing him, but he can't prosecute the person for robbing him. So it has to be a credible person. The clerk, having 
had someone give the clerk knowledge that a crime's been committed, if the clerk believes the person, the clerk can file the complaint. That's just like you have somebody come to you and say, my next door neighbor, I saw him shoot somebody and bury him in the backyard. But I'm terrified of that guy. I'm not saying a word to anybody. If you believe that person, then you have standing to file a complaint against the person. And that's sufficient to initiate a prosecution and trigger an examining trial. At an examining trial, the court would then call in or subpoena the actual witness and would have to get firsthand knowledge. The prosecutor in either case cannot bring any of this information before the pro- for, for the court. Does that make sense? Yes, but let me ask you a question. <clears throat> if a police officer goes to the clerk or somebody at the courthouse to, to, to file the uh, criminal complaint, then what the police officer is telling them is hearsay. No, what they're hearing is hearsay. Uh, okay, I'm sorry. Well, right. Yeah, they're getting hearsay. It's hearsay for the person receiving it. Correct. It's, yeah, not for the officer. For the officer, he's best best evidence witness. But if he gives it to somebody else and they try to give it to the court, then it's hearsay. So in in my particular case of, of thought process, if if I was ever charged and I went into a court, I would ask the judge for the criminal complaint to be given to me to review right then and there, and that I want whoever signed that to be compelled to come to court immediately because they have accused me of this. And I have the right to cross-examination. This goes to what in Alabama will be called a preliminary hearing. In Texas, it will be called an examining trial. The case that established it is Gerstein Pugh out of Florida, but it is a federal case out of Florida. And it says that if a person is arrested for any reason, with or without a warrant, they have a right to an immediate preliminary hearing. That means the and every state's statutes say that any time a police officer arrests a person with or without a warrant, they if there is a warrant, they are to take them directly to the magistrate who issued the warrant. Because if you look at a warrant, it will always say, Arrest this person and bring him before me. Reason for that is if there is a warrant, then the warrant was necessarily entered ex parte, meaning only one party was present. One party went to a magistrate, invoked the magistrate's duty, to hold a preliminary hearing, and the magistrate held a preliminary hearing based on the testimony of one party and found probable cause. But since it was ex parte, as soon as they're arrested, they're to be brought back before that magistrate so that the accused has opportunity to enter exculpatory evidence and to be faced by his accuser. If a clerk filed a complaint, she is not the accuser. The one who brought the testimony to the the evidence to the clerk is the accuser, and you have a right to face them. Can I tell you a real quick story? Sure. We like stories here. Great. Well, this is a true life story in northwest Florida. About 1995 or 1996, I don't remember exactly what it was. The speed limit on Highway 90, which goes across part of the country or all of it, I can't remember. But at any rate, <clears throat> I was running radar. It's in the evening, probably 11 or 12, something. I'm guessing I can't remember. It wasn't important fact. But anyway, 
the speed limit's 55 and somebody's coming through at 70. There is some traffic, it's not, it's not a lot. I, I pulled the man over. I'm going to think he was in his mid 50s. And when I come up to him, I told him who I was, didn't ask him why I stopped him. I told him why I was stopping him and asked him for his driver's license, for registration, and, and insurance. He said, sir, before we go any further, I've got some things to take. Okay. He said, I'm not going to cooperate with your investigation. I have no duty to do so. You're asking me to provide evidence that will exonerate me or, in your opinion, find me probable cause against me, maybe to arrest me. So I'm going to, first of all, exercise my Fifth Amendment right not to talk to you. But okay. He said, the second thing is, if you have any idea of issuing me a citation or a summons or a notice to appear in court, let me just tell you what's going to happen. I'm going to connect myself to you at the ways for several years to come because you're going to be the witness, the complainant, both, and you're going to serve me process. And you're interested in this case. So unless you got somebody in your car that's going to serve me, you're going to be in trouble. And if you don't have it filed correctly with the court, with the correct court seal on it, you're going to be in trouble. So you can do what you want to do, and I'm going to do what I'm going to do. And I thought about it for a minute, and I said, I know this might be a bizarre question, but is there any possibility that you might, of your own free will, wait for 15 minutes here and let me think about this because I've never actually had this happen before. He said, you know, I'll wait here all night with you. He said, this is important to me. I said, it's important to me. I don't want to be connected at the waist with you for the rest of my life, and you're probably the kind of guy that would do that. And you've been very nice and very polite. He said, you have too. He said, I just know not to trust policemen until they prove their trust. And I don't know you from Adam's house cat. So I thought about it, thought about it, thought about it. And I said, you know what? I said, you're a pretty good guy. I'm going to trust you. Have a good night. And I did have his license plate number. And I, what I did was I checked his license plate number against the driver, which he probably was. And there was no wants or warrants or no other reason to detain him. And I said, this is a penance. This is a small little thing. And I told him, have a good night. And he left. And I talked to the state's attorney the next day or next business day. And he said, you probably did one of the smartest things in your life because this guy's either an attorney or he knows the law forwards and backwards. And uh, when you mess with them, they're going to really mess up your life. And they're going to smile while they're doing it. And there ain't a damn thing you can do about it. So when you come up on people like this and it's just a ticket, just let it go. You made a good decision. Hey, I like this guy. Yeah. I, I would like, I'd like to know this guy. Right. It wasn't cheap, was it? I can't remember. <laughs> the last, I got a ticket here in the town I live in. The cop was real professional and polite. And I was, too, and I told him, I'm kind of glad I got this ticket. I've been waiting to get one here. He said, you have? I said, oh, yeah. I said, I am fixing to give you a romp through the legal system. You are not going to believe. <laughs> oh, you are? I said, yes, I am. I just went to court. <laughs> and the General Sessions judge was the judge in the court. I sat in this guy's courtroom, and he was exactly the kind of judge I've always wanted to watch. And the first thing I told him, I have a complaint. I said, well, what's that? You're here. I wanted a municipal judge. He said, well, I am the municipal judge. Well, doggone it. I already promised you that I wouldn't come after you, and I had all these rotten things I was going to do to you. I was even going to ask you to arrest that officer for aggravated assault. Well, I'm sorry to mess things up for you, Mr. Kelton. <laughs> he dismissed the case. Uh -huh. then, then asked me if I had an objection to it. And I did. <laughs> but I dropped it. 
Hang on, Randy Kelton, Rule of Law Radio. Uh, we'll be right back. Hello. Randy Kelton. I wanted this guy. This kid got arrested recently. Are you there? I'm here. Yeah. Uh, okay, I, I keep wanting to say scroungy dog. Stray dog. dog. Yeah, stray dog the exposer. <laughs> yeah, you, you'll get used to my sense of humor. Yeah, it's all good. <laughs> okay, uh, uh, we, want to, we want to introduce you. Uh, okay, uh, what was your name? I go by stray dog. Just stray dog. Okay, stray yes. dog, this is Damien, Damien uh, Jones. Yeah, I'm familiar with who he is. I've seen some of his videos. Hi, uh, Say hello, Damien. Hey. How you doing, Damien? Or Chief, right? What do you go by? Yeah, they used to. Most people call me Chief. Yeah, but it, it, you know, if you don't call me late for supper, we got it. <laughs> I, I don't know if you're, if you're familiar with my channel, Stray Dog the Exposer. But uh, Stray Dog what now? The Exposer. I'm out of. Uh, uh, I'm the. Uh, uh, Cop watcher out of New Mexico. Right. I, and unfortunately, I have it, but my next mission when I get off the radio will be to look you up immediately. Right, huh? That'll I cool. will forward you some uh, links to some of his uh, videos. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Randy. <clears throat> okay, when we come back in, uh, Stray, I'm going to want you to just introduce yourself what you do, where you're at, and kind of give us an idea of why you do what you do. Okay. And then, then I'm going to go to Brett. Brett's my co-host. Brett, say hello to Stray. Hey there. Hey, Brett. And Brett's going to talk about, about what he's doing in court. I, I, I definitely wanted you to hear this because most of the auditors – uh, are pretty good on the front end, but when it gets past the front end, like you got arrested, uh, when it gets to that part, then you kind of don't know how to handle that part. Right. And <coughs> Brett's, Brett's been where you are, and then he, he got past that and took these guys on, and you'll find out what happens. I, I want you to understand that they're actually easier to beat up in the courts than they are dealing with the cop on the street. For sure, yeah. It's just knowing how to beat them up. Yeah, I would really love to know how to take it to the next level. <laughs> we will definitely take it to the next level. <laughs> yeah, sounds awesome. He was, Brett was telling me about what he was doing. He couldn't, couldn't hardly get it told from laughing so much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm ready to have some fun with them. Oh, you, you'll, be, you'll see, when you, when you get up to these guys in higher positions, they're much more politi politically sensitive. Uh, That's when you really have the influence. Okay, going, going back in. I can find the right screen. Okay, going in. Okay, we are back. Randy Kelton, Wet Fountain, Rue of Law Radio, and we have another guest on, a stray dog, the enforcer from New Mexico. He the is, exposer. I'm sorry. <laughs> I like enforcer better. The, the exposer. I've actually got it written here. <laughs> he is a cop watcher, a First Amendment auditor out of New Mexico. And I was just watching some videos he was doing. Okay, will you explain to us what you do and what motivates you and what your purpose is in doing what you do and, and what kind of got you into doing this? Well, I was, uh, before I was doing cop watching and auditing, I was uh, getting into uh, photography and videography. And when I was researching uh, those topics, I ran into First Amendment audit videos. And I thought it was pretty cool seeing these guys stand up to police the way they were and, and were pretty knowledgeable. And I said, this is something that I need to learn how to do. So I studied up on local laws and, uh, you know, the ordinances and state laws and the Constitution. And I realized how much power we really have, you know. And if we, if more of us knew this, a lot of us could do uh, a lot more about it. 
hold on. We're having an issue here. You're you're fading in and out. Am I? Uh, do you, are you using a headset? Uh, no, just a regular, just a mic and hang on. Maybe I can. Okay. Are you using your onboard speakers? Okay. Is this better? I'm not, I'm not sure until you talk some more. If <clears throat> turn your speakers down as low as you can get them and okay. still be able to hear, that'll prevent feedback back into the mic. Okay. And we might you're fading up, you're coming up and down, and we have suppressors on the system. And this, if we're getting feedback, that could cause the suppressors to push you up and down. Okay, try it again. Okay, how, how's this? Well, we'll That's talk and see. Much better, much better. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, I just realized after uh, studying up on the laws and Constitution, how much power we actually have. And if more of us learn this, you know, we could fight back pretty good. And uh, so I started doing my own around here and uh, watching other videos and other auditors and seeing how they go about their business. And and then I kind of, you know, developing my own style and, and started doing my thing around here. <clears throat> So you didn't have any, you know, I was just talking to someone today who, uh, when he was younger, had police beat him up. Oh, yeah. I mean, I witnessed plenty of tyranny, even on my own part. Now, I've never been beat up or nothing, but just, you know, where we, you call the police for a certain service and they don't get it to you, you know, or uh, they get an attitude with you. They treat you as the criminal, stuff like that. You know, cases don't get filed or charges don't get pressed or whatever. And, and you know, just shit like that. Stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you can't say that stuff on the air. We're, yeah, we're on, we're on live radio, so be a little careful with that. Uh, okay, I understand recently you were arrested. Uh, about about now, um, 10 months ago, I believe, something like that. <clears throat> and I just we just beat the case in appeals court. We lost magistrate court, of course, and uh, we won in appeals court. Okay, that's good because I watched the video. <clears throat> the fact that you won in a in appeals court. What did the appeals court give as the reason that you won? Uh, the they said it was a female judge. She said I might have been ob obnoxious, but I didn't break any laws. Okay, so the appeals court didn't reverse and remand. They dismissed. Okay, it's, yes, sir, it's dismissed. So the fact that the judge ruled that you did not break any laws means that the officer's actions were illegal and improper. Absolutely. Are you familiar with the term res judicata? No, sir. Res judicata means already adjudicated. Okay. That their actions were wrongful is already adjudicated, especially since the court said you didn't break any laws. That means the arrest was absolutely wrongful. And the way I read the code, if a public official exerts or purports to exert an authority they do not expressly have, and in the process denies a citizen full free access to or enjoyment of a right, why that's a class A misdemeanor in every state. If someone makes a threat, I'm, I'm sorry, if someone commits simple assault, which is offensive speech or offensive touching, and in this case, the officer did both. He threatened you with arrest. If you didn't do what he told you to do and you didn't do it, so he then arrested you. And in the, in, in, the video I saw of the arrest, he told you once when you objected, he, he didn't tell you to turn around and put your hands behind your back. He grabbed you and wrenched your arm around your back. That is simple assault in anybody's book. Sure. <clears throat> so if you commit simple assault while prominently displaying a deadly weapon, that's a second-degree felony in every state, except one that I know of, and that would be Texas. In Texas, if you commit second-degree felony aggravated assault, 
and you are a public official acting under the color or pretense of an official capacity, it is a felony of the first degree. Article 4, Section 1, U.S. Constitution. Good faith and credit. If the legislature of one state has addressed an issue that the legislature of another state has not addressed, then under the federal constitution's provision for good faith and credit, you may bring that law into the foreign state. Charge him with first degree felony aggravated assault. Okay. See how that works for him. And we and make the argument that since New Mexico hasn't addressed specifically aggravated assault by a public official acting under color of authority, and the Texas legislature has, you can bring that in and charge him with first degree felony. And they're going to say, well, you can't do that. So, well, let's test this under law. And we'll take this all the way to the federal supreme because this is the kind of an issue that we would need to go to the federal supreme for to get guidance for the lower courts. The vast majority of certioraries do not get picked up by the Fed, by the supreme. Something like 97% do not get picked up. The only thing the supreme wants to look at <clears throat> are cases where the Supreme would need to give guidance to the lower courts. So we're always looking for issues that we can claim, where we can claim that the court needs to give guidance. This is a pretty good one. <laughs> and when the lawyers look at it, you know, they're going to look at it from the perspective of this will take six or seven years and umpteen hundreds of thousands of dollars before we can get this thing out of the court system. And good chance they'll come to the table. At the end of the day, it's all about the money. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> Always all about the money. So what would so, I go straight to the to the DA here? Or no, 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 no. Okay. <clears throat> The district attorney is a lawyer representing the state. Mm -hmm. At this point, the, there is only an accusation. There is not a prosecution. Therefore, the state does not need a lawyer. The prosecutor has no standing. <clears throat> the way I read the code, the lawyer doesn't have a thing to say about anything until there has been a preliminary hearing by a magistrate or an indictment by a grand jury. In this case, you're charging him with a felony. It's a grand jury issue. But the first thing you want is a magistrate to hold a preliminary hearing. <clears throat> it's not necessary. A grand jury indictment can be had without an examining trial or without a preliminary hearing. But if there is a indictment, then there has to be a preliminary hearing. And, well, it's this way in Texas. This is really fine detail in the code that may be somewhat different in, in New Mexico. What the code says in, in uh, Texas you know, every state requires a preliminary hearing. And in ten Texas, you can get an indictment without a preliminary hearing. And at a preliminary hearing, an accused has opportunity to introduce exculpatory evidence. In a presentment to a grand jury, that's not the case. So if there is an indictment and there has been no preliminary hearing, the indictment cannot be filed with the court until the person's arrested and brought before a magistrate. 
They bring him before the magistrate, and he has opportunity to enter exculpatory evidence, which could then potentially mitigate the evidence that got the indictment. Does that make sense? I think so. I think okay. it does. One thing to, to do about law, you know, people call in my show and they think I'm some kind of wizard guru. No, no, that's not really it. I'm just an old guy. And one thing I've, I've found out over the years, that we have a very well-structured legal system. If something seems like it should be a certain way, almost every time it is. It's just a matter of go and find the laws that, that set it that way. We have a great body of law. So if you look at something and say, and you have to look at it, from both sides. If this is unfair to one side, we're missing something. There's a law we're missing. And, and in this case, uh, there, an indictment is unfair because it doesn't give the accused opportunity to enter exculpatory evidence. Probably going to be the same in New Mexico because the same inequity appears in, Mex in the, every state that this would happen. So what I'm doing is going into kind of the details how these pieces fit together. You can go to the grand jury, or you can go to a magistrate. Uh, you can go to a prosecutor, but I'm saying he didn't have anything to say about it. What's going to happen is when you go to a magistrate, they're going to think they're a judge. And they are a judge until you go before them and make an accusation of a, a violation of a penal law. Then their, their judge's hat comes off, their magistrate's hat goes on. And the only thing a magistrate can do is they can marry people. That's so they can make a few extra bucks. <laughs> they can hold a preliminary hearing and set bail. That's it. That's as a magistrate. <clears throat> so when you give the judge notice that a crime's been committed, you have taken off his judge's hat and put on his magistrate's hat, whether he knows it or not. And most of the time they don't know it. And we have a rule, don't tell them if they don't know. Hang on, about to go to break. Randy Kelton, <laughs> Brett Fountain, Real Law Radio. We'll be right back. Okay, we are back. Randy Kelton, Brett Fountain, Real Law Radio. And on the break, uh, Damien made a good point of something I stepped over. Uh, some of the backside details that I didn't get to. Damien, will you address what we were talking about on the break with Stray Dog? Yes, sir. Well, Stray Dog with Chief Jones here. That's how most people know me. Okay. But, um, you know, you, you was talking about, like, when you come across some auditors while you was doing some photography and videography, and, but, but, you know, people see things and it's interesting to them, but there has to be some spark in your soul or your heart or your brain that says this connected the dots for you to the point that you said, I'm not going to sit back and be an observer. I'm going to be one that influences people and I'm going to educate people, police, public officials, citizens. What happened in your mind and in your spirit? To spark that, well, I've always, <clears throat> excuse me, I've always, uh, you know, fought for the underdog, even since I was a kid, and uh, also I don't, I don't like being ignorant of something, so and I don't like being bullied. <clears throat> so when I seen these videos of, of these auditors and stuff, I, I do a lot of as much, you know, community involvement as I can here at home, as far as. Uh, like I live next to an intersection. There's a lot of wrecks, people constantly running the stop signs and stuff. And uh, so I like to record that. Yes, sir. People who run a stop sign on blast on, on Facebook or wherever. And there's also the, the school zone uh, right next to me. And once in a while, I'll go out there and I'll talk with the crossing guard. And once in a while, there isn't a crossing guard. And I'll go out there and start walking children across myself. And of course, traffic sometimes have a, trouble slowing down when they need to and I'll yell at them and report them and uh, so I've always wanted to do something to help in, in a sense and I know how the tyranny is real and 
cops get away with a lot of things. I know the, the primary job is basically generating revenue and keeping our jails and prisons populated. So uh, I see them getting away with so much, and it makes me angry. That's what normally, as a rule, from all the auditors I know, that's what sparked it with them. They either run into somebody that was doing it, and they said they found a a partial remedy to the problem, and they were trying to do it right and learn. But, you know, in your case, what was you doing that caused the police to even encounter you to start with and you don't have to go into a lot of detail, but what started it and going through the system, how did that happen? Uh, are you talking about recently or throughout life? Well, I'm talking about the time when you was arrested like 10 months ago. <clears throat> oh, okay. Well, I went out there because I'm also, you know, doing independent journalism. And since I'm out there already with the camera and stuff, at least I would know how to defend myself if I ever had an issue with the law and stuff. And, uh, or security guards or whatever. And I didn't want to just, okay, okay, I'll leave. I don't want to get arrested. I'll leave. I want to be able to stand my ground. So I was, anyways, I was out there doing a recording of the Navajo refinery in Artesia, New Mexico. And the security came out right away telling me I can't be, I can't be filming. It's federal, this and that, and protected by Homeland Security. And, you know, and I told them, no, I can't. I'm not on your property. I'm on public property. I can, you know, post bill. I can record whatever my eyes can see. And, uh, they have Jersey barricades going down the side of the road, which is actually on public property, not on their, their uh, property line. I had researched the GIS survey before I went, so I knew exactly where I was about to be. And so anyways, I, I walked down and I still uh, walked out on the outside of the, of the barricades. And while I was walking, another employee of the place had drove uh, down the highway and stopped in the middle of the highway telling me I can't be filming and this and that. And I talked to him, telling him, yes, I can. I already talked to security and blah, blah, blah. I kept walking. And then uh, <clears throat> another uh, safety guy pulled in and, and, and started telling me that he can't be filming and stuff. And I told him the same thing. I've been on public property the entire time. So eventually the cops show up. And when the female cop first came, she asked me for my ID and told her, and I'm not going to give it to her. She can put good citizen the report and she says i'm not going to put good citizen i need your id and i said well i'm not going to give it to you and then uh, I, I gave her the whole spill i said look i'm walking I'm, I'm on public property those signs that say do not report they don't apply to me i'm not on their property i don't work for them there's no penal codes or statutes under the sign that says this is a law i just i said not until if i go on their property then i become subject to those rules out here on public property well then the mail cop showed up and the first thing she told him was, he's refusing to give me ID. So he says, well, that's an arrestable offense. And I said, no. I said, unless I've been he's committing a crime. He's all, no, sir. No, sir. I said, yes, it is. And he's all, no, sir. And then uh, she tells, uh, tells him, I'm going to go see if they want him trespassed. So while she was gone, uh, I was worried that, you know what, she might come back with, with some reason that she can uh, ID me or whatever. So figured if I'm going to get arrested, I need to get this guy to arrest me here and now before she comes back. So Wait, wait. so they, you, they were asking if you were going to get trespassed off of public property? <laughs> yes, it was, I guess, trying to solicit a trespass. And, and she figured if she did, that that would give her a uh, legal reason to identify me. And uh, but so in that process, while she was talking to security, uh, he was telling me, there are signs everywhere saying can't record and I said I told him I don't care those I can record that you traffic whatever I want and stuff and I told him uh he says it doesn't matter and I said it does matter you're ignorant if you don't know the law you got that badge and that gun but you don't even know how are you gonna enforce something you don't even know and he interrupts me do you have your ID I said I'm not giving you my ID he says, all right turn your hand turn around put your hands behind your back so as I was putting my camera equipment down he actually grabbed my wrist and Pulled me away and put me up against the pole. All that. So I was telling him, "Be gentle. I'm not resisting." But uh, you know, he, he learned he was wrong. They both so, learned wrong. So now the courts have ruled that he was wrong. Yeah. That makes everything that he did illegal. 
that makes him putting his hand on you while he was prominently displaying a deadly weapon, aggravated assault. Because if he hadn't had that pistol, while well, you'd have just whooped his behind. <laughs> Isn't that right? Yeah, absolutely. But you couldn't because he had that pistol. That made it aggravated assault. Yeah, I didn't even think about resisting at that time. Yeah, that was not a good idea. I'd, you know, we have some guys that uh, say that you have the right to resist arrest. I say, yeah, you do. You have the right to get shot, too. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, that's the problem. You won't be any help to us if you're dead. You won't be any help to the movement in from behind bars. So stay out of jail. Don't get shot. There's another way of doing this. You took them to the courts. And did they – do you have a court-appointed lawyer or did you hire one? I got one. I had a couple that were – offering their services to me when they seen the video, but they were more local and I wanted to get, I wanted to outsource. So I found one in Albuquerque that he was representing me on contingency. Oh, so he is going to sue them. Yes. It's in the process now, as far as I, as far oh, as I know. Good. While he's preparing the suit, you might want to up the ante for him. You take criminal complaints against this officer and get them not to act on it. <laughs> Each one of those is a denial of due process. A denial of due process is a criminal act, and a deni denial of due process is a tort. Each denial of due process is a separate tort. So you walk them up the system. So would this be on, this, on the same suit? Will they all be separate suits? No, no, no. The criminal is different. And and they will whine about that. They'll say, well, if you find a civil suit, you can't file a criminal. Not true. They don't have anything to do with each other. Okay. They, they committed criminal acts against you. If you have knowledge that a crime has been committed, it is your duty to report that crime. And when you report that crime to an official who has a duty, he must do it. It doesn't matter if it's one of his buddies. It doesn't matter if it's a policeman he works with all the time. He still has the same duty. Hang on, about to go to break. Randy Kelton, Boulevard Radio. When we come back, I'll have Brett talk about what he's been doing. We'll be right back. Okay, we are back. Randy Kelton. Brett Fountain, Rule Law Radio, here with Chief Jones and Stray Dog, and I wanted to kind of, I wanted to bring Brett on. Brett called me earlier. You know, Brett's now a co-host, but he started out just a caller and had some legal issues. And uh, I get a lot of people calling in saying, "What can I do?" And the vast majority of them, we we tell them what they can do, and uh, then they go away. And we never hear from them again. Most of them are just really calling in to vent their anger and frustration, and they don't have the time or the drive or whatever it takes to really take these guys on. Every once in a while, we find someone who takes them on, and Brett was one of them. When he first started calling me, he was terrified and had no idea what to do. He's, he's shooting in the dark. But I would give him things to do, and unlike most people that I talk to, he would actually go out and do it. And once he got a little bit of a start, he picked it up and did his own research and took these guys on. Will you tell them what the latest adventure you're having is, Brett, and what's going on there? Sure. The latest adventure. Well, out in Wood County, East Texas. I got a I got a letter just out of the blue. It wasn't like a, a a police officer roadside encounter or something. Just a letter out of the blue that says uh, July eight. They said that I uh, demanded I show up in county court over there on the sixteenth, or else I'm going to lose my bond. I'm going to have my bond forfeited, and I'm going to have a, a warrant issued for my arrest if I don't show up on the sixteenth. They didn't even say what it was about. I have no idea what it's about. So I went down there on the 12th because they weren't responding to me. I tried to respond immediately on the 9th. I was writing letters, and they, they weren't 
they weren't uh, responsive at all. I went over there on the 12th and I went to see the judge and ask the judge, hey, what's this about? And the, the judge's staff told me, oh, she's unavailable. Okay. So I went over to the court clerk and I took a look at the file and I said, I'd like to see the file. And and they showed me the file. There's a complaint and information in there. looks like somebody did their homework and they were trying to do something right. But look at this. The complaint and information is based on an alleged offense that already got a judicial dismissal. And it wasn't even in that county. It was in a city, a city in that county, but the city had dismissed. And now the county's trying to stir up trouble and pretend like they already had a case going on in the county. And now they're going to just like somehow pick up where the other one left off as if there were no dismissal. So I'm looking at this. Wow. They, they are trying to revive a dismissed case. Interesting. And I'm going back and forth between the county clerk and going to the district judge had an office there. I went to go see if he would be available. And they're all directing me around, pointing fingers to each other, I'm going upstairs, downstairs. And then um, so I, I borrowed a piece of paper. I said, I'd like to write a motion. I borrowed a piece of paper and I'm sitting there in front of the county clerk. I'm writing my motion, handwritten. And a couple of sheriff deputies come around and decide that they need to throw me in jail. Well, that's what they did. They said, well, there's a warrant for your arrest. Oh, really? I want to see it. What's it for? Oh, uh, I don't have it right now. Okay, where is it? <laughs> How are you going to get it? Where is it? What do you mean you're going to arrest me without a warrant and you're going to pretend there's a warrant? This is interesting. I'm right here with the magistrates that you're supposed to take me to. Will you take me there? It's right there. I'm pointing at the doorway across the hall. Right there. There's the magistrate. That you're. If you, if you had a warrant, you'd be able to pull it out and read it that it says on the warrant, deliver this person to me. Isn't that right, Randy? Isn't that what the, yes, the if, warrant would tell them to do? Yes. If there had been a warrant, it would have to be in the file. And it wasn't. And they they would not have the original warrant. They'd have a copy of the original, and the original had to be in that file. And guess what? Just a few minutes before those, those uh, deputies had come around was when I got a copy of the record. And... The lady that normally would give you a copy for free because uh, I'm the accused, she would want to see that I'm the accused, and she would give me a copy for free because she's required to by law. Uh, but she was off doing a coffee run, and the person filling in didn't know any better and thought that I just should be charged like public records request, and she charged me a dollar a page. So that means I now have a receipt in my hand that shows that <laughs> – there was, there could not have possibly been a warrant. Not only did I, can I testify that there was no warrant there, but the receipt says there's not enough pages to to sneak a warrant in there. So <laughs> I know there was no warrant. Well, they came up with one. Five hours later, they had a backdated warrant with my name on it to to justify everything that those officers had just done and my five hours in jail. So then I started, when I got out, I started uh, looking for who's who and why and who are you responsible to and let's find out what you say your rules are. And, and so I've been at this point, I got the, I found out that the, the person who is stirring up trouble is a hired assistant. She doesn't even have any authority to do anything but she's pretending that she is her boss so that's impersonating a public official right there it's against the law in texas you can't impersonate a public official so she's pretending she's her boss she's signing documents and doing things like that well there's a big crime right there so went ahead and filed some criminal charges uh, and also she's stirring up trouble that's in texas we have something uh, we have a Penal code offense. It's codified as baritry. It's when somebody, it's usually a lawyer, but it could be other professions. It's when someone stirs up trouble just so that they can be paid to deal with that trouble. 
So for a lawyer, that's typically known as the ambulance chasers. They go and, and say, oh, you sure you're okay? You look like your neck might be hurting. I can help you with that. We can sue them. And, and that's against the law in Texas. Yes, so it's here's called, this lawyer. It's called fomenting litigation. Mm-hmm. You create litigation where litigation otherwise likely would not have occurred. And then you get to profit by representing the litigation. It's a felony in Texas. Right. So this this lawyer who's stirring up the trouble, she's guilty not only of the impersonating a public official, impersonating the DA. She's actually our district attorney. She's also guilty of other things like this baritry, which is a felony of the third degree. This is not little minor stuff. She's not allowed to do this. Nobody's allowed to do this. So filing criminal charges, I filed uh, several against her and against her boss for letting her get away with it. Her boss is technically responsible for everything that she does. Any subordinate has what you call respondeat superior is, is the one in charge. Top dog, the actual DA, should have trained her people to not go out and commit crimes. Well, she failed to do that. Who knows? Maybe she facilitated it. Hey, y'all go ahead and stir up as much trouble as you want so we can have plenty of money flowing in here. Who knows what she's doing? But bottom line is it was her job to teach her people the right way to do, to, to act, and they're not. They're committing crimes. So that's on her. That's on the, the DA herself. So the DA gets criminal charges too. Now, the judge – is not allowed to go and create a warrant after the fact. Number one, they're not allowed to stir up trouble and, and have a complaint and information in the file, and the accused never finds out about it. A copy has to go to the accused. That's just that's basic common sense. It's not only the law, it's common sense. So we'll probably have to continue this on the other side of the break, but uh, we we have a judge who is complicit in – these felonies and high-level misdemeanors that these attorneys have done so that a judge is held responsible. The judge is not allowed to just go along with that and facilitate. Does the judge have have authority to run off the cliff? (laughs) We'll be right back. Stray dog. Yeah. You see what what you can do? Yeah, it's you know the the more and more of your podcasts I listen to, the more familiar it's coming becoming to my ears. <clears throat> and uh, well, you know what? I was looking at New Mexico just a few minutes ago when you were talking. The uh, New Mexico is one of the states. There's about half of them, according to Wikipedia, that have what they call stop and identify. Yeah, that doesn't have to be a crime. They can just waltz up to you and. You have to identify. No, that's not true. They have to articulate reasonable suspicion that a crime has been committed, is being committed, or is about to be committed to in order to demand ID. They can ask ID, but the moment you what you decline, they're supposed to drop it. Once if they continue to ask, they've gone outside the scope of their authority. So it's, it's, they can ask, but it's not mandatory that you respond unless they articulate. Problem. Right. So they have to have RAS. And the, the non-stopping ID states, you don't have to ID unless you've been actually arrested. Mm-hmm. That's the, di- the difference well, between the two. Tell me about, uh, maybe you know more about this. I'm looking at uh, New Mexico statutes here. It's, uh, the it's 30? categorized as interference with law enforcement, 30, 22-3, concealing identity. Yeah. That, that's, so how do they, is that what they try to spin to... Yes, that's what I was arrested for. for yes, sir. That's what they try to give me for, but... That's still it's still a secondary offense. You have to have a, you know, they have to have our RAS, and then if you deny, then they can charge you with that thirty, twenty two, whatever mm-hmm. it is. Okay, so it's real similar to everywhere else. Okay, let's go <clears> back here. Okay. Uh, where were you, Brad? Mm-hmm. I think I was on. Okay. Go ahead. Okay, we are back. Randy Kelton, Brett Fountain, Rules Law Radio. 
And Brown Brett was just about to pounce on the county judge. <laughs> right. So the county judge has a responsibility. In Texas, we have a code of judicial conduct. And judges are required to follow certain kinds of behavior and abstain from other kinds of behavior. Well, one of the things that's a requirement for a judge is if they see a lawyer screwing up, they have to report that lawyer to the state bar. They have to do appropriate <clears throat> disciplinary action. They can't just sit there and go along with it like, oh, here's all this paperwork that just magically appeared. And, oh, yeah, well, we're not going to really notify the accused. Uh, yeah, sure, I'll, I'll back data uh, arrest warrant for you, no problem. That's, that's a real big problem for a judge to do things like that. So for me, I consider that that judge is not fair or impartial, totally incapable of giving me a fair trial. Because she's a criminal. She's a felon. She's over here committing horrible, heinous crimes against the people. I can't have somebody like that up on the bench and trust that everything's going to be okay. So I'm yes, going to disqualify. And she is subject to co-warranto removal. So I put a motion in to the county court to disqualify that judge. Uh, and just if anybody doesn't know, disqualification is simply means that you are that the judge is not going to be able to hear your case. Somebody else has to come and sit on the bench for that particular case, because for whatever reason, the judge has an interest in the case. Maybe it's a family or maybe it's a. For, for some financial reason, the judge obviously can't be fair and impartial. They're biased, and you just show that there's a bias, and that judge can't preside over your case. Or, or the judge is incompetent. Mm -hmm. And in this case, the judge is incompetent because the judge committed a crime that vacated the office. Right. So when I move for disqualification, the judge has three days, three business days to decide what to do, plan A or plan B. The judge doesn't get the prerogative to just go ahead and do whatever they want, blow it off. Sometimes they do. They just think they can deny the motion or something. And No, I'm not going to be disqualified. No, deny it. But they actually only have two options in the law. They have to either look at the motion and say, you know what, he's right. I'm not going to be able to be fair and impartial in this. I'm too mad at this guy or whatever. I, I don't like him. This is not going to work. And they step down. Or they take the motion and say, you know what? I'm doing everything. I'm not going to be pushed off this bench. I'm, And so they have to forward that motion to what's called the presiding regional judge of an administrative judicial region. In Texas, we have 11 of those. I don't know how other states carve it up, but, but we have – Judges whose whose role is to help with the administration of other courts. And so when a judge gets disqualified or has a motion for disqualification before the court, well, then that goes from the judge whose disqualification is sought up to the admin judge. The presiding regional judge looks at the motion and says, and he, the presiding regional judge has, by statute, he has to do this immediately. He doesn't get to hold off and wait and sit on it for a while. Justice is waiting immediately. He has no prerogative to delay. So he looks at the motion. He decides whether or not the, the lower court judge needs to be disqualified, kicked off the bench or not, continue the case or bring somebody else in. Well, the judge, it just so happens that the judge over this particular county judge is already a criminal. I've already reported this particular <laughs> presiding regional judge for his crimes. So that's not going to work. If she's going to send it to him, well, I've got to disqualify him too, which means it has to go to the chief justice of the Texas Supreme Court to assign somebody or to rule on it himself. Well, now Chief Justice Nathan Hecht has two motions for disqualification in front of him. The one for the county judge who just in, invented and backdated a warrant out of thin air and tried to <laughs> –
facilitate a felon, felon, felonious activities of an assistant DA, or <laughs> he needs to tell them to dismiss it, or he needs to do something. But he can't just sit on this. He's got to return a response to the disqualifications, one for the county judge and one for the presiding regional judge. Well, meanwhile, I've been also doing some public information requests. I've been asking the sheriff to tell me about, uh, hey, how is it exactly that you train your deputies to handle warrants? Somebody just tells them on the radio that there's a warrant and the warrant doesn't ever actually have to exist until after they're in jail. That's interesting. And uh, again, about uh, what it is that they're supposed to do when they get a warrant. So you don't actually read the warrant and say the part what it says about, hmm, take this person and bring them to me, the magistrate. You just instead, as a matter of, of course, you take the person and incarcerate them. How, how is that legitimate at all? I'm asking these questions, and I'm asking questions about their insurance and their surety bonds that they might have on their officers and on the organization because I want them to know that uh, this is a risk for them, for their people to act badly and commit crimes is a risk. Whether or not I ever actually sue them is a different question. But for them, they just need to know He's asking around. He's nosing. He's looking at our uh, our risk here. <laughs> so hopefully, this is encouraging them to tighten up and start acting right. I don't know if I'm going to get any uh, apologies, and Randy's telling me I'm not going to get any Christmas cards from them. <laughs> we'll just see how this all plays out. Yeah, that, actually, that that Christmas card thing—that's a risk you got to take. <laughs> Shoot, I was just—I was so looking forward to those Christmas cards. Yeah. Well, what, okay, didn't you have an issue with the attorney general? Oh yes, I've been to the attorney general as well. Uh, in fact, when the sheriff was a little bit slow to respond to some of my information requests. Um, it took him six days too long to get me some of the information I asked for. And, you know, to be to be fair to him, he did go ahead and, and send me the stuff. He didn't wait until the last day and then send me a note that said that he's going to talk to the attorney general about it. And then that's an automatic another 45 days of waiting because a lot of the lawyers will pull shenanigans like that. But uh you know, in his defense, he did go ahead and send me the information. Too bad he was six days late. That's six days, according to Texas law, six days of official misconduct, which the AG, the attorney general, is uh, responsible to address. That's official oppression. That's a penal code big deal. So the attorney general, I went to the attorney general and said, hey, you need to go talk to this guy over here. I've got a public information request, and he's got six counts of uh, official misconduct, and you need to train them. And I, by the way, send me a copy of what you send to them. I want to I see a copy of that. I also want to know a copy of anything that uh, if the this particular sheriff or anybody in that county – has a pending case before the attorney general because then that affects something about their timing of how they respond. So I asked those questions, and the attorney general didn't answer, which after 10 days, if the attorney general does not respond to a records request, who is who are we supposed to report that to? <laughs> So I waited. I didn't call him on that just yet because I had some other questions in the hopper. And these other questions got a good, strong response, very positive, actually. And they even gave me the name of a different department that handles education and enforcement and gave me their fax number, which they try to, I don't know, for some reason, they usually seem to try to hide those things. But um, they must have thought I had a real uh, important issue and it was worthwhile or something. And so they connected me with this other department. 
<laughs> meanwhile, they're neglecting their own records request. So, well, you know, I did kind of hide it at the bottom of the document. It was more like the PS than anything else, but <laughs> if they didn't pay attention. I mean, I did go ahead and point it out. Hey, that was a records request on the 31st of July. <laughs> <laughs> this is how we create politics now you got those guys on the bottom that screwed around a little bit but instead of trying to address it with them and have them all try to protect one another you move up way above them mm -hmm. I also what? moved up to the governor I went to Governor Greg Abbott uh, with I found out that the the assistant who's stirring up the trouble has for a boss someone who is an appointee by the governor. She wasn't elected. Like everybody else that's a DA is supposed to normally be elected, right? We elect our district attorneys. At least that's the way it is in Texas. And if there's ever a vacancy, then the governor will appoint someone to temporarily fill that role until there can be an election. Well, this lady was an appointee because her predecessor was accused of official oppression. And rather than address those issues, he ran. So there was a vacancy in the district attorney office in Wood County. And Governor Greg Abbott appointed someone. So I went to Governor Greg Abbott with public, requ public uh, records requests Thank wanting you. to find out. Hmm? About to go to break. Oh, good. Thank you. We'll be right back. Okay, we are back. Randy Kelton, Brett Fountain, River Radio, here with Chief Jones and Stray Dog. Okay, Brett, you were finishing up on your fun and games in legal land. Well, yeah, if you could call it fun and games. Uh, so let's see, where were we when you so rudely interrupted you, me with the cliff? You were, you were going to the, you were talking about the Attorney General. Uh, I think we've been to the Attorney General. Uh, so it was the Governor, oh, the was Governor, Governor Abbott. Governor, yes, Governor, because Governor, Governor Abbott. Abbott had appointed the District Attorney. And for all reasons, get this, the reason for the vacancy is because of official oppression. Well, so when I go to the governor a couple of days ago and bring up the fact that uh, this official oppression is going on right now from your appointee, what do you have to say about that? I don't imagine there's going to be real happy phone conversations going on <laughs> yesterday and today. <laughs> I, I, somehow I just have a sense that. The <laughs> and, and, and Stray, yes. that, that's one of the things to. To understand, you're the baddest motor scooter in the building. And the best way to demonstrate this is to talk about the military. When I was in the military, if a general was coming to visit the base, we had to get out and mow every piece of grass, pick up every cigarette butt. Everything had to be absolutely perfect. Detail because, detail. The, yeah, because the general's coming. The only thing worse than the general is the civilian because the civilian is the only one that can walk into the general's office and crawl down his throat just like Brett can go to the governor and crawl down his throat. The governor is not going to like being asked to answer these kinds of questions. And... The higher up you move in any governmental agency, the more sensitive the individuals get to uh, the political ramifications of what you're doing. The guys at the bottom, you know, they're, they're not generally the sharpest knives in the drawer and they're not making that much money and they're not in that important a position. But as you move up, the higher up you get, the more people this person has who wants his job. So politics begins to become very important. And they all understand that 
perception is everything. So what Brett is doing is creating political cannon fodder that these guys' political enemies can use against them. That's where you are at your most powerful. And their problem is there is absolutely nothing they can do. When I'm going after someone, I want to work my way up to the highest level judge I can get to. And generally in a district, that's going to be the district judge. I start filing criminal complaints with every magistrate along the way and the you know, work my way up to the district judge and invoke his duty as a magistrate. And when he doesn't perform that duty, I file against him. Once you filed against the district judge, then if anybody says or does anything you don't like, you accuse the district judge personally of sending him them to do that to you to persecute you. I live in a small town. I live right next to City Hall. And they know me pretty well there. So we got a new cop who didn't know who I was. And I'm out doing some plastic welding on a tank with a little propane torch. And it was in the middle of a drought. This new cop came up, said, sir, sir. And I turned around. There's this cop there. And he says, sir, uh, you can't have that open flame. And I held up the propane torch and I rotated. I said, sure, I can. Look, nothing to it. Oh, you don't understand. We have a fire ban on. Well, they could put on a fire ban if they wanted to, but they couldn't afford it. So I said, uh, anyway, so I told him, look, you see this equipment? It's all high-pressure spray equipment. I can outrun the fire department. I understand, sir, but you can't have that open flame. Wait a minute. You're joking, right? Oh, no, sir, this is not a joke. Wait a minute. That John Fostel, the district judge, sent you out here to harass me, didn't he? Just because I filed one crummy little making a terroristic threat complaint against him with the attorney general. He sent you out here to screw with me, didn't he? The cop steps back, holds up both hands with his palms out and said, uh, one moment, sir. Took out his cell phone, dialed. About 30 seconds, the chief of police stepped out of the back door of the city hall and said, Randy, what are you doing to my new officer? And I said, oh, Tom, I was just jerking his chain. And the cops said, oh, God, I saw my whole career pass before my eyes. That, that was a revelation. That cop was terrified of that judge. And when he thought I was going to accuse the judge of sending him out to do that to me, it terrified him. So when you get past these chumps on the bottom and you get up to the top, chief, what do you think about that from your experience? Well, I've had people come into my office and they are usually pretty cordial <clears throat> want to shake hands uh more men than women but some women and they'll say i want to talk to you about something okay is this personal or is it business related it, it's 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 about a cop okay well let me close the door if that's okay with you if it's not i'll leave it open but i don't you know, think you want your business out there. Yes, sir. I would usually shut the door and say, tell me, he says, well, I don't want no retaliation. I said, well, I'm the right guy to talk to because that gets under my skin really bad, really fast. And he says, well, you got a sergeant that's running rough shot in this particular case over some kids. I said, how old are these kids between 14 and 17? I said, okay, is any of them your children or grandchildren? No, but but I've seen this. Okay, so you're telling me firsthand you eyewitness this? Yes. Well, what did he allegedly do? He says, well, he was talking to them pretty harsh. And I said, well, what was it about? And he says, well, they uh, went to Walmart and got some black 
some sort of over the counter mucinex or something. And they were kind of, I guess, using it to get high. I said, really? I said, well, you can't be, uh, you know, doing that. And so he says, right. He says, but he shouldn't have approached them like that. Now, in my opinion, I know if I don't satisfy him, one, he's going to show up at a city council meeting. Because if he's going to come talk to me, he'll go there. He's going to talk to the mayor. He's going to talk to everybody in town about that cop, but not only that cop, that, that mean chief. So, you know, I want to do the right thing automatically. But I do have in the back of my mind, you know, that this is trouble for me personally, as well as this cop. Now, I said, if it's okay with you, I'll just bring him in. With me in here? Yeah. Well, he might retaliate. And I said, if he retaliates against you, then I'll have him arrested. I'll arrest him. I said, in the conversation. And we're going to talk like gentlemen. Okay. I call him in and said, this gentleman make this allegation against you. the sergeant without skipping heartbeat said, that's a fact, chief. I said, so now we're on the same page. You agree that you've done what he said you did. Yes, sir. I said, what was your motive? What was going on? Tell me and tell the complainant both. He said, these kids are anywhere from the ninth grade to seniors. Some of them I knew from my own child that they were doing these things, and some of them was getting off the sidewalk because they were half awake, half asleep, trying to get high. And some of them almost got run over by cars. And the first thing the guy said, well, I didn't know that. He said, I've talked to him a dozen times. I'm trying to theoretically scare them straight and tell them that there are statutes on the book and I can arrest them for these things, but we don't want to start them a record. So I was trying to scare them straight. He said, if you don't want me to do it, I won't do it. And we can pick up their dead bodies off the street. How do you like doing? He said, oh, it was a total misunderstanding on my part. He said, I had the wrong perception. And I said, so <clears throat> I have a complaint form here and I'm ready to take the complaint and go through the official process. No, sir. No, sir. We're, we're, we're good. And I said, so when, when you talk to people, are you, what are you going to tell them about this sergeant now? He's looking out for the kids. I said, okay, that's, that's good. I said, what about me? Do you feel like I've treated you fair? Oh, yeah. This man showed up at the next city council meeting and said, I want to talk to you about our sergeant and our chief. This sergeant, I misunderstood, come to the chief. The chief called him in. We talked like gentlemen, and we got some fine policemen here. And I just wanted to let you all know, because other people's talking about it, and I just want to get it out on the table. And he says, here's what really happened. So, you know, that was kudos to me. The mayor talked to me yeah. after the council meeting and said, you're doing great. If we had our police consistently acting that way, Stray Dog wouldn't be here. I wouldn't well, that be would here. be wonderful. Yes. Yeah. So we need to give them reason. And, and you indicated exactly the problem they have. You knew that. If this guy didn't get satisfaction from you, there wasn't anything to stop him from going right up the chain of command and firing up everybody. If right. you if what you done have done is right, you're going to have to explain yourself. But the system is prepared to listen to the police officer and accept his side of the story. And that's really as it should be. But if you're in the wrong and you have to struggle to make your explanations, you could have a real problem. And that's how it ought to be. Right now, we don't have these checks and balances in place. And I don't suggest to anybody that we do anything out of meanness or avarice. If we're not doing this to help the people at the bottom save their careers we're not doing it for the right reason 
I think of them like I do my grandkids. I love them dearly, but if one of them runs out in the road, I'm fixing tan his hide. Hang on, about to go to break. Randy Kelton, Brett Fountain, Rule of Law Radio on this 23rd day of August. Okay, we are back. Randy Kelton, Rule of Law Radio. And Brett, were you finishing up? I lost my place. I don't. I don't think I was talking or saying anything. There. I think I, I think I was talking. Straight. Yeah. I'm trying to remember also. <laughs> okay. Okay. I got into I got into Damon's story and, and yeah, Damon was telling this really interesting story on the break, and we all lost where we were at. I think you would call it a cliffhanger. <laughs> Yeah, I kind of, I kind of run off the edge of the cliff there. But okay, uh, main thing I wanted to to get across today is there is a way to go after these guys, and and we're getting close to the point. I'm going to go ahead and turn the phone lines on. So if you have a question or a comment, see, give us a call. Uh, our call in number five one two six four six nineteen eighty four. Prefer you have questions on topic but if not that'll be okay what one of the things i'm trying to demonstrate to chief and to stray and to casey is what we do here these are a group of people who are, are the guys i've been looking for since i've been doing this show who are willing to go out and take these issues to the police now if we can get them to adopt some of these tools that we have, uh, I was telling them, uh, I think they hold the key to the matrix. This matrix that's been developing, we have a police state emerging. And it's, it's emerged to the point that it's becoming a serious problem. People are really beginning to notice it. But Technology has improved to the point that we are able to actually take some action at the bottom. The bottom is is what everything else is built on top of. If we can destabilize their agenda at the bottom, then everything above it falls apart. And everything depends on for the government, them being able to maintain control of the public. And they're using the police to do it, and there's a problem with that. The police are not highly trained military jackbooted thugs. The police are part of us. And I know I was talking to Chief uh, the last time, before he came on the last time, and how he had talked to a number of officers who were had been in the military, and then they went through police training here, and they were concerned because they're training the police to treat the public as if we are the enemy, as if they are in a war zone. And uh, I've been in a war zone, and I can assure you this is not one. And well, a lot of them dress. It looks like they're headed into war. That's exactly what that's about. The my the thing that, that bothers me the most are the bulletproof vests. When I wore a flak jacket, it touched me all around. I felt it all the time. And that flak jacket was a constant reminder that you never know when the bullet's going to come or where it's going to come from that's going to kill you today. Because there was, there was always that nagging feeling that today could be the last day of the rest of your life. And that flak jacket was a constant reminder. I see police with these things on, and I understand why they're freaked out. I was collecting some images of police today from some of these uh, the First Amendment audit videos got this policeman with four clips on his chest and he's just bristling with armament. I didn't have that much when I was in combat. 
And I'm looking at this thinking, what in the world is going on? This is insane. We can stop this. We can have I, the key. Go ahead. Can I come in and tell you something? <clears throat> I understand some of the logic. Although it's very unsettling, I at least understand. In the, let's see, it would have been sometime in the late 80s or very early 90s, but I think it was late 80s, that in California, they had midget shooters. And that ain't a joke. I mean, they were really midgets, and they were in the trunk of cars by guys that were doing really bad things like robbing banks or what have you. So when the police would go to pull the car over, that car would pull over like normal. So it didn't heighten nobody up. There was no big alert. And when the police, because those guys had a peephole they could look at, and when they seen the police exit the car before he got to them, they would come out and go crazy with those machine guns. That's one of the reasons that they touch cars because they started teaching the academy to touch the back of the car, make sure there's no movement. And if there is, step back and regroup. Well, <clears throat> so there was a big push even for little agencies to get police vests. And the vest, you know, were worn under the shirt, between the shirt and the T-shirt, but some of them were next to their body, and they had another layer under that. And so when, when all that happened, then a few people had an idea that had been in the military. Well, some of them had vests that were military fashioned, but they had purchased them out of their own pocket. So they started coming up with ideas because they were coming up in the ranks. Let's wear it on the outside. It's more comfortable and we can do like in the military and we can put these extra pouches on there. We can do this and do that. And it's going to be when I was coming up, your presence in your uniform was supposed to do all the speaking as to what your authority was. If you had to tell somebody you're an officer, you're done. You had to show up, look good, clean uniform, press, shine boots or shoes, and talk professional, take control of the situation, but not overlord the situation. And so it was an Adam-12 kind of thing. And it, it, it started to evolve into a, some kind of thing like Starsky and Hutch. You got guys out on the street that's acting like they're drug agents or something. And it started to change. And then you had them putting on these these vests on the outside and there was some blowback in certain cities because they said, look, it looks like these guys are overseas somewhere in in a war theater and we're not on a military base and we don't like this. Some departments reverted backward, but as other bigger departments come along and it's harder to go up the chain in a large department because there's a lot of people, a lot of fluff in the middle that you got to go through four, five, six, eight people to get to the chief or the sheriff or the constable. So, you know, these are built in layers to keep you away from them. But eventually when enough bigger agencies doing it, then a lot of smaller agencies started doing it. And we're on a war footing. That's what I see. He's a war footing. Hang on. About to go to break. Randy Kelton, Brett Fountain, Rule of Our Radio. A call in number 512 646 1984. We have four people on the board, so we're, the board will only hold four. So if you can't get in, uh, wait till a caller drops off and then try it. We'll be right back. Okay, we are back. Randy Kelton, Brett Fountain, Wheel of Law Radio, and we went out on a war footing, and Stray had a comment about that. Go ahead, Stray. Yeah, I, I think uh, uh, a lot of that is isolated incidents, that, and they overuse the politically correctness of officer safety. 
But I think the the real reason for all that is to instill fear in the in the citizens and make the citizens, which most do, fear police. And I, I think that's what we need to change. You know, we need to flip that around. I don't like conspiracy theories. And in this case, I don't think they're necessary. I think this is kind of a natural thing because, you know, there are other things going on in the world. Uh, Fifty years ago, we didn't have this uh, communication as good as we have now. And we didn't hear about all the every bad thing that happened everywhere. We're in a population of 320 or 30 million. I think it's up to 330 million. 99.99% of all of the people never have any problems, never get any trouble, never cause anybody any problems. But we hear about all these horrible things constantly. And that's because every bad thing that happens, we hear about. And every time a policeman gets in a uh, gunfight, everybody on the planet hears about it. So it sounds like the problem is far worse than it is. How to fix it? I think cop block or cop watch and First Amendment audits by ordinary citizens, that's the only way we're going to fix it. Ordinary cop down here on the street getting his butt kicked on a regular basis. And the only way he can get along with the public is to treat the public with dignity and respect. The same thing he expects back. A lot, a lot of viewers, they, they tell me that, that, you know, they wish they had the same courage that, that us auditors had because they want to get out there and do the same. But they're afraid of the police, you know. They're afraid to put the camera, hold it up, and be seen that they're recording them. They're afraid to be confronted. And yeah, the vast majority are, and that's how it's always going to be. Uh, the American Revolution was fought by three percent of the population. Oh, good point. Point. Good point. Yeah. It's it, we don't need everybody, and uh, I've been doing this show for a long time. And originally, I was frustrated that I didn't get more people stepping up. But I'm older now, and uh, I understand that you have to be mentally in the right place to be able to do this. And everybody can't do it. But everybody doesn't need to do it. 3% would be all we need, be more than we need. If we got 1%, we would change this country's, our police and citizen relationships very quickly. Let me tell you something that happened after 9-11. The public had a mass change in their thinking. They were willing to give up liberty for security, which Benjamin Franklin said, if you do, you deserve neither. But what happened was, at that time, there were several police departments across the country, and I'm talking from little towns that have three or four policemen, including reserves, to several thousand police that they were short anywhere from one or two guys to, you know, maybe uh, 500, depending on the size of the department. So they sent their recruiters down to the exit centers for the military for guys that were coming out the gate that just got their DD-214s. And they said, you got your DD-214? Yeah, well, I'm with so-and-so department. We're recruiting. And you're the kind of guy we're looking for because you're already disciplined and you already know weapons. We just have to put you in an academy. So they started heavily, heavily hiring these people that just come back from war zones. And he was getting more. That that is such a bad idea. It is. When When I come back from a war zone, I was badly broken. I didn't know I was badly broken. The worst thing that could have happened to me was me become a policeman. Absolutely, I should not have been there. But the the thing is that they come back with the war mentality. They have not decompressed. They 
they have a lot of them PTSD or other mental or emotional. I think there's something much worse that's never talked about. There's, I don't think there's any drug worse than adrenaline. That's what was, that's what was wrong with me. Every day when I was there, the adrenaline was, was cranked because any minute could be the last. I once stood on the front of a Jeep spotting incoming. I was 21, invisible, invincible, and I essentially dared them to shoot me off that Jeep. And they accommodated me. But there was nothing more thrilling than getting shot off that Jeep. Wow, that was wild. (laughs) And then that helicopter gunship come (laughs) over us poured a stream of streamers out into the into the bushes and run them off but there was that was crazy wild you come back and there's no place to get this adrenaline rush i'm 40 years down the road i still miss it part of what gets me to do what i do i've had about 20 different policemen pull pistols on me and point them at me and well, that's cool. You know, <laughs> I have to really struggle with myself. And we'll hire these guys as policemen? Are they insane? Well, anyway, well, enough of that. I, I'm just saying that it began to change. So even though these were civilian policemen, they were somewhere between acting like military police and were on a federal reservation or a war footing to where they're overly caught and ready to rock with people when they show up, they're looking for action. It's just like a battlefield with some different rules of engagement. And they're trying to pivot between two worlds, a war footing and civilian life. They haven't even decompressed. So they got all this anger and all these different emotions built up. And so now they're, they're wearing a, Different uniform, but it's a uniform. It's got a badge on it, and they're carrying a gun, riding around in new equipment most days, and all this technology that they may have been gone for years, and they just come back, and there's this revolution in technology they're just learning about. And, you know, so this is right up their alley. I can carry a gun. I got authority. I'm told to charge the hill, and I follow my orders. Don't matter if they're legal or illegal. They got right or qualified right. immunity to back them up. Right. Yeah, they, yeah, and and they are there. They need that adrenaline rush. So they create situations that give them an opportunity to feed their addiction. They need excuses well, to exert authority. Well, chief. I'm curious. Uh, you mentioned earlier about that that fellow that was on the side of the road that told you uh, he's going to be wrapped around your waist for the next few years if you make this choice or that. And I'm wondering if that kind of uh, that kind of possibility put in front of these guys, even if they're on their uh, they're looking for the next rush of adrenaline, maybe something like that, a comment like that, could just kind of uh diffuse their the situation what do you think well can i can i respond that to that from a veteran side okay if i get a guy like that i'm seeing a general that i have to deal with that would shut me down immediately this is not a place you want to go That's how my superiors treated me with that kind of reserve. I wouldn't have messed with him on a bet. So it would, the military types, that would be very effective with. Well, let let me say this. I, I thought to myself, you know, several things. Maybe this guy's right. That's the first thing I thought. What if, what if he's right and I'm wrong? What if now, if I do uh, arrest him for something or I cite him for something, 
chances are he's going to do what he says. He looks like he means business. And if I'm wrong, I'm going to be in serious trouble. Even if I'm right, I'm still probably going to be in court for a long time. Okay, hang on. Got to go to break. We'll be right back. Okay, we are back. Randy Kelton, Brett Fountain, Rule of Law Radio, and we're all cranked up on adrenaline. Uh, I would, I think it's time I went to some callers. We've we'll see where we're at. We're in the last hour. So I'm hoping I've got some questions on point. Uh, hello, Tina. What do you have for us today? Hello, Tina. Are you there? Oh, she just dropped off. Okay. Tina had it dropped off. Going to Scott. He's probably got something on point. Uh, it's it's probably won't mean anything, and it'll sound like a redneck. But oh, Tina's that, back. That's that's Scott. Hello, Scott. Well, hey, I'll just make a couple of quick comments, and then I'll get off here. Um, I thought it was pretty funny, Chief, uh, when you were talking about that cop getting sued and then he wound up having to drive a truck because I filed like eight different lawsuits on cops, city attorneys, and judges. So chances of them getting to be driving a truck aren't that good, but it sure is fun to think about it. And and talking about uh, 911, I've called 911 on the cops myself twice. Uh, when I had some cops stalking me over in Mesquite, and once you call 911, they find it a, a, a real good reason to hightail it and get away from you as fast as possible. And the second time I called them on there was when they wouldn't allow me access into a court building. And um, so I called 911 and them. They found that they wound up letting me in, and uh, I wound up beating that case. But what I wanted to ask uh, Chief Jones is. Have you ever had or have you have you been introduced to the right to travel? And would you be surprised to find that a state just had a bill that just got struck down that was definitively delineating our right to travel? Are you aware of that? I'm not aware of that case. And I know the what the what the uh, general perception is and belief by many people the right to travel and you know i I, i'd say you know uh specifically one court said the right to locomotion uh right of free movement in the form you choose by foot skateboard roller skates it doesn't matter a tractor you got a right of free movement and they're interfering with your free movement and your locomotion uh for frivolous reasons. So I understand all the arguments, and I've got several case laws on this for various states from probably the 1920s through the 1990s at least. But yeah, no, so, yes. this, is not a case, this, this is not a case. This is not a case law. This was actually a House bill in New Hampshire that just got struck down in this last session in 2019. And it was the, the analysis of it. It says this bill restates the right to travel and requires the Department of Safety to provide at no cost to all non commercial automobile and non commercial conveyance owners a decal and identification card that the state and holder is exempt from registering his or her automobile or other private conveyance under the superior authority of RSA and the Uniform Commercial Code which provides exemption for non-taxable consumer goods and household goods and repeals the requirements for certain travelers or drivers to acquire non-commercial driver's license. And the only reason I bring it up is because it's such a big deal because if New Hampshire had have passed it, then what we've been talking about the good faith and credit, everybody in every other state could have used this to definitively delineate their right to travel because this goes into this, this actually just nails it all down and how the state, by their silence and failure to fully inform the sovereign people of the rising of the offer to contract, was inducement by fraud in committing the tort of conversion. This is in their document. 
So I gave Randy has a copy of it, so he could forward it. To uh, yeah, I can send you a copy. I just gave a copy to a judge here in town. It 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 acts as a brief on the subject, and this is a subject we address a lot. And there is a issue with terms here, right to travel. The courts have said what that goes to is your right to travel from one state to another state. So it's only applicable on the border. Inside the state, you have the right to locomotion. And they're juxtaposing those two, and they don't fit together well because right to travel is a federal issue because you're moving from one state to another. Once you're inside the state, you do have the right to locomotion within the state. The courts have held that a state has a vested interest in the safety of the public. So for the restricted purpose of determining that an individual is competent to operate the motorized conveyance and is knowledgeable of the rules of the road, they can require a that they secure a license. But then the states have taken that to mean that because they had to require the license, acquire the license for this purpose, that we can extend that to the presumption that any locomotion using a motorized conveyance is necessarily commercial. And that's where the problem rests. The fact that I have a license on my vehicle and I have a commercial license in my pocket does not give reasonable probable cause to believe that I am operating in commerce because there can be a reason to secure those that does not include commerce. And that's my story and I'm sticking to it. No, that's all I wanted to just bring up. So other than that, uh, it's good to hear y'all. I'm glad you're back on, Chief, and uh, keep telling some stories. Other than that, y'all have a good show. Good night. Okay. Thank you, Scott. Okay, now we're going to go to from redneck to hillbilly. Uh, Danny Murphy, I first met Danny down near Houston. And he set up a seminar for me a long time ago in the Houston area. And then he, he since moved to Tennessee, and then now I'm in Tennessee, and we're about 60 miles apart. Hello, Danny. What do you have for us today? Well, just a few things I've been working on. And, and an idea, I know you, you real interested in that uh, First Amendment audit. Yeah, yes, let me mention, I, I talked to Danny about – Going down to Jackson, uh, <laughs> Jackson has a federal courthouse. It's about 60 or 70 miles from uh, Memphis. And it's kind of a sub-courthouse for the main courthouse in Memphis. And I wanted to go down there and do an audit with the U.S. Marshals because the U.S. Marshals are the most vulnerable. Uh, so I'm going to go down there and he's going to be my – my second, my, what do you call it, you, my, not my sidekick. Anyway, he's going to run. Wingman. S- wingman, that's what I was looking for. So I gig him, and he's back away from me watching, waiting for them to step across the line. And then he, he calls 911 and accuses the marshals of violating my rights. Uh, there's nothing worse than a third-party intervener. Hardest thing to deal with. Uh, Brett, in the case with Tim and Laura, Brett was the third-party intervener. And I feel relatively certain that in uh, Tim and Laura's case against the city of Newark, the reason they knuckled under and, and bailed out was because they had Brett coming after them. And they had no idea who he was or what was going on with him. And when they don't know what's going on, they'll invent something or imagine something much worse than what's actually going on. So I tend to think there were a lot of other factors going on there for him, too, not just me. Well, we've we've been putting a lot of pressure on him, but I've had we've done this before. This you get a third party in there. 
And it makes them crazy because they don't know what they're dealing with. So I want to use Danny as the third party. Okay, Danny, uh, we keep interrupting you. What did you have for us? Well, anyway, I got some court stuff going on. And uh, really, it's the whole thing's void because don't have a valid uh, complaint and warrant to start things with. And I sent you that... uh, Yes, and uh, you sent me – okay, Danny sent me a an argument for – to dismiss the complaint. Will you explain the argument about the director of revenue? Oh, well, okay. That's, I don't remember sending you that, but the, uh, the, the, the commissioner of revenue – or Tennessee is the register of uh, vehicles, and uh, he delegates that to county clerks to uh, to do the registrations and stuff. And uh, so my thought on that is, and it kind of goes along with that New Hampshire uh, idea. Uh, my thought is that. Really don't need to change the law. You just need to inform the people who don't actually need a vehicle, because by the definition, the vehicle is a implement of commerce. So if they're not going to be using it that way, there's no real requirement by the law for them to register it, except to keep the police off of them and make the police learn what it really is too. And. Uh, you know, start start getting them in a situation where you either got to give the uh, the uh, notice to people so they can decide for themselves if they're really doing what is. Okay, wait, wait, hang on. We're about to go to break. Randy Kelton, okay. Brett Fountain, Rule of Our Radio. We'll be right back. Okay, we are back. Randy Kelton, Brett Fountain. My, my tang is getting toggled. Brett Fountain, Rule of Law Radio, and we're talking to Danny in Tennessee. Okay, Danny, what were your questions before we keep we kept interrupting you? Uh, well, n- not a question, but you had me started there, and I'd like to finish what I kind of got going there. Okay. That cause you mentioned that was mentioned earlier about that uh, bill in uh, in New Hampshire. Well, I've been in contact with a sponsor of that bill, and uh, so I don't I don't know if they've had a session since the one I first found out about or not. Because, uh, but anyway, he he seemed to be interested in one one of my ideas about giving the notice to people. You don't have to change the like the transportation code itself. You just give notice to people at the time of registration or before they register so they actually know what it is. But the police also need to know what a vehicle actually is. And, and you might be interested in this little little deal had in a motion to suppress in court a little while back, my special question there, that, uh, you know, they did the usual thing, had their witness up there and, what it was, this thing, that thing, but, you know, it's always saying vehicle. And uh, so when it came my turn to uh, examine him, when I asked my question, I saw glances go back and forth between the judge and the prosecutor. My question to him, main question to him was, uh, what was it that he observed about the car that he stopped that caused him to conclude that it met the requirements for... Uh, the legal status of vehicle, because as I read in the code, vehicle is more of a legal status, not a physical attribute, and it can change in an instant. And one of the things by the code that makes it a a vehicle is having it registered. The other thing is, even if it's not registered, if it's actually being used for that purpose, that you're transporting or providing transportation to commercial movement of things, uh, then it's then it's a vehicle whether it's registered or not, and so they can stick you with it. But you know, 
it's, it's voluntary to put your uh, car or device, as the word used in the definition itself, to uh, register it to use as a vehicle. And But the police don't know that. So when I asked that question, well, the cop there, he had no idea what I was talking about. So they haven't really been taught what it is. That's very unfortunate. Do you have any suggestions yeah. about how to, we could uh, help train the police in that? Because that's not normally a role. The police don't typically listen to the people. Yeah, I have a suggestion. Charge him with aggravated assault. <laughs> there you go. Okay, oh. aggravated <laughs> assault is such a serious crime. The likelihood of getting him indicted for something like that is less than zero or none. Not going to happen. Now, if you charged him with something lesser and a grand jury happened to be, one of them happened to be PO'd at cops, you might get him indicted. But when the policeman pulled me over for uh, expired registration, and I call 911, I want him arrested for first-degree felony aggravated assault. That's not going to happen. I don't intend for that to happen. I certainly don't intend to get him, him to get indicted for it, but I do want him to have to look at the code and see how I got there. You could be. Well, let me, let me Go just ahead. jump r real quick. Um, uh, when we got anything from the state attorney's office or the attorney general's office, someplace it's DA or state attorney or attorney general, whatever they call you there, when we would get something like something was reclassified, then every officer had to read it, sign off, and there was usually a legal, from the legal department, there was usually a brief that was attached to it that says for purposes of this and purposes of that. So every officer had to sign it and it had to be kept on file. So if they did what they used to do and now it's been reinterpreted by the courts or the attorney general, then the police do what they're told to do. So one day we come in and I get the mail and there's something that says, you will find uh, a separate package that should arrive at the same time or ahead of this that is victim right code books or something to that effect. And every time that somebody is a victim of a crime, you must give them this book. If they're a victim of sexual crime, you must refer them to this section. So we had to put them in the patrol car and officers griping about it. Why do we got to do all this? Because the attorney general said we had to and if we don't we're derelict in our duties why would you not want people to have it it's just one more thing to go through well then get another dang job you either do your job or go somewhere else these are our marching orders and it's lawful and it's necessary so <clears throat> i guarantee you if ken paxton in texas sent out a letter to all law enforcement in texas tomorrow that said if a man or woman is in their private automobile going about their business, they're not required to register their cars. They're not required to have driver's license. And unless they're committing some crime with their automobile, don't stop them. That would come to a probably screeching halt and take about 30 or 45 days, but it would stop. That's just how fast it works. That's a good idea to go to push this to Ken Paxton. Notice. Yeah. So if, if so, if I call nine one one and ask the officer to arrest the other officer, I get a victim's pamphlet. <laughs> <laughs> that would be way too much fun. And 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 just for the record, you know, I get a lot of flack on the show about saying that I never want a public official indicted. That's never my purpose. And always stray when you go before you go in and do one of these audits, you need to be able to s articulate your in your intended out ultimate outcome. 
at the end of the day, what are you trying to achieve? And what I'm doing, I have an a intended ultimate outcome. And that, that outcome is to place every judge in the country in a position such that when he steps up behind the bench and looks out across the bar at the gallery, I want him wondering which one. Which one of those scoundrels sitting out there and waiting for me to render a ruling he don't like so he can run down the grand jury and try to get me indicted? Everything I do filters through that intended ultimate outcome. We all need one. We, we, if we don't know where we're going, good chance we'll end up, wind up somewhere else. And once we do know where we're going, once we do have a fixed outcome, they won't be able to turn us from that outcome. And that makes us very, very hard to deal with. I'm, I'm a short circuit to Danny again. Danny, are you still there? Yep. You hear me? Okay. Yeah, there was, you sent me some documents. And in those documents, you asked the officer if he had been appointed by the was the commissioner of revenue who was it you were saying had to appoint the officer as a oh, well they, they to be able to enforce traffic the laws the commissioner of revenue is the register of vehicles so he's the one in charge of all that and the registration he also gets to appoint his own officers and it also has provision there in particular that says uh, <laughs> I forgot how it puts it, but, you know, he's in charge. Uh, he, they do the enforcement of the, the registration and certificate of titles unless there's some specific law, you know, providing that to someone else. Well, there is a specific law for him to delegate it to the county clerks to do the registration, but there's not one for the police or sheriff to go out and check the registrations and, and do something about it. So, you know, them asking that, that's, you know, my uh, accusation of impersonating a law enforcement officer. It's not just an impersonating. Okay, a somebody, police, somebody's got a lot of background noise. Department of Revenue. That is an interesting and, uh, argument. So that argument would, would be restricted to registration enforcement. And not, and not the, the traffic laws in general. Right. Have you addressed the delegation of authority to enforce the traffic laws? We had uh, Olivier, and he was saying that only highway patrol could enforce the traffic laws except in the case of an accident in the state of Tennessee. Are you, f you familiar with that argument? Well, yeah, I've come across some of that, and, it, and I didn't see it as the traffic laws, but to to deal with the driver license. And, you know, there is that special, and, it, and I don't remember, you know, an explicit statement of it being limited to the Department of uh, Public Safety, except when there's a special law. But I did come across a special law, and that one about the accident. Okay. Have you looked at the authority to enforce the transportation code? Is there a delegation of that authority to municipal or county officers? Well, I haven't found, uh, I don't remember coming across that explicitly, but I have found where in a way, it's implied in that uh, when a city or someplace has, you know, is doing that, they cannot have uh, quotas, things like that. Okay, but that's not good enough. That doesn't imply they, they can do it. There has to be something that specifically authorizes them because this is not a penal statute. It's not part of, right. of the penal code. It's a professional conduct code. Oh. So it would take a separate delegation. Right. Oh, yeah, that's what you, you said. That what you just then said reminded me of, of another thing, talking about things in the penal code. I think there are a few things that should be more in the penal code. And that was like 
the way the DUI statute is written up. I don't remember all the words, but it had something in there about, you know, someone using or operating an automobile or other motor vehicle. Well, my question there was, well, why did they put automobile in there rather than just motor vehicle in general? And I'm just kind of guessing that, that, that you know, somebody... Okay, okay, I'm guessing we're about to run off the cliff. Hang on, okay. we'll be right back. Okay, we are back. Randy Kelton, Brett Fountain, Rule of Law Radio, and we're talking to Danny in Tennessee. Okay, Danny, uh, we'll stop interrupting you because we've got to move along. We've got two more callers and two more segments. Okay, well, let me let me get on to something else more along the line of what uh, my need is here. Because I've got this stuff in court, but I need to get it out of that court because I feel like they're getting ready to do something really unpleasant. To me, so, and I sent you that uh, 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 complaint, like I wrote up, that shows that uh, from the city court here, they, they never, never do the complaint right. So, all those court cases after that are really void for lack of a proper complaint. And so I was thinking one of the easy ways to get this out of that court to start with is interlocutory appeal because I had to pre-trial motions, and some of them were uh, dispositive, so it, it would end the case and get it up into the uh, Court of Criminal Appeals. And then after they get ready and start asking for briefs or something, then challenge your jurisdiction on the matter because the trial court didn't have jurisdiction to have them to dismiss it for without jurisdiction and, and that of the trial court as well. Yeah, didn't didn't you have a challenge to the sufficiency of the complaint? Uh, yeah, but they wanted to put it off. And so what he was saying... Wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. That's a, a subject matter jurisdiction challenge. It doesn't have to say subject matter jurisdiction challenge. It is what it is. It's a subject matter jurisdiction challenge. They can't go anywhere until they get past that. So when you say put it off, does that mean put it off so they can address other things, or did they just get a continuance? Uh, well, they got me to agree to it, which I shouldn't have done. But the way he said it is that, like, it, it'll put it off because otherwise it just has to go through it again. And in trying to get to this other thing, you also got the prosecutor got a motion for uh, for uh, uh, revoke bond, but they didn't have enough days on that, so extend the days. And I feel like the way he was saying that about having to do it again, that I brought it up then, he's going to just deny it. They're just... Uh, Okay, this is this is a subject matter jurisdiction challenge. They don't get to revoke bond when there's a subject matter jurisdiction challenge before the court. Mm -hmm. The court the court cannot do anything until they address jurisdiction. If the complaint is insufficient, then the complaint lacks the legal capacity to invoke the subject matter jurisdiction of the court. You need to address that. Then if, well, if you win your argument, then there is no bond, there is no nothing. And a subject matter jurisdiction well, challenge would absolutely st stop them from doing anything else. But, you know, a while, a while back I wrote, wrote something to you that said I thought this had become political. By that, I mean, not, my, not that I'm working the politics, but... This is becoming a political prosecution because this stuff about the vehicle can affect affect the revenues to the local government bodies. So that gives them a reason. To, so give them another way to dismiss this so they can make that problem go away. Well, that's that's what this was. I mean, that's what this this okay. was. it wasn't their fault. It's this other court. You know, God didn't do his job, so I thought they would take it. But 
Okay. You can, okay, the, the, you need to refile this uh, claim on the insufficiency of the complaint as a subject matter jurisdiction challenge. You cannot waive subject matter jurisdiction. So even with your agreement, that doesn't give them any power to do anything else. Yeah, it occurs to me that's kind of like some guy walking up and saying, Hi, I'm here to uh, with my armored truck. I'm here to pick up all your cash. And the the person at the register says, well, uh, I, that's, you're not the guy. Well, yeah, but well, let's put that off because we're just going to have to revisit that again later. No, that doesn't get put off. Yeah, yeah this is subject matter jurisdiction. The judge can go nowhere until this is addressed. Not even he, your consent doesn't mean anything. You can't consent to the judge's jurisdiction. That's absolutely complete. I well established. I can send you lots of case law on that. Well, yeah, I know that, but uh, jurisdiction cannot be conferred by agreement. So, by them getting you to agree to put something off on the threat of of you having your bond revoked and thrown in jail, that's horse manure. Prepare a subject matter jurisdiction challenge and move to dismiss the case for because the charging instrument is insufficient. That is always the first thing to go to in every case. Sufficiency of the charging instrument. Well, after the authority of the officer to issue the charging instrument. Have you addressed the officer? Was this a... Highway Patrol or a local officer who issued the complaint? Okay. Well, no. The problem was the uh, the magistrate not signed by the magistrate or the the authorized clerk. Did the complaint in was it a traffic citation or traffic issue that initiated the issue? Did the officer have authority to enforce the traffic laws? I say no, but they've already denied that. Okay, well that's that's appealable then. Uh, then did the complaint allege uh, on the probable cause for the initial stop? Did it allege? Uh, Commerce. Mm, no. It's not, as a traffic citation, it's insufficient. One of the elements of traffic is commerce. If there is no commerce, there is no traffic, there is no jurisdiction. That should get a jurisdiction. You look for challenges that they're not going to want to get to the higher courts. So look for where the, the specific jurisdiction is, is specifically authorized to enforce this professional conduct code. It, it's not part of the penal code, so it's not a part of what a peace officer enforces. It's a professional conduct code. So it has to have special authority. You know, the building code, the building inspector has special authority to enforce that. Medical codes, the uh, American Medical Association or the State Medical Association, uh, bar, group, bar standards, each one of those has someone authorized to enforce. In order for an officer to enforce transportation code, since it is a professions code, they have to have specific authority. And the highway patrol is given specific authority. Who else? Uh -huh. That's the argument we make in Texas. Hey, you, the, you, got, you got some other callers waiting you're going to get to? Yes, yes, we do. Okay, well, let me let, me let you let's, go and I'll call you tomorrow. How about that? Okay, let's talk about this offline. Okay, thank you, Danny. Yeah.
Yeah. Now we're going to Tina in California. Hello, Miss Tina. Hello, Randy. How are you? I am good. Uh, how is your campaign against the lawyer in the Supreme Court of California going? Well, uh, the Supreme Court has not responded to my friend's request for um, the names of the clerks that did the you know, uh, research. Good. That should get it. Okay, Tina filed a bar. And then jumped off the cliff. Where were you, Brett? I was counting on you. I tried flashing up the word break on your screen, all caps, and I just let it work. It was the all caps. I never pay attention to all caps. That's one of those patriot mythology things that have been around for a long time. <laughs> well, I should have sent you a flag with a fringe on it, but you wouldn't pay attention, right? <laughs> I'm, I'm generally pretty easy to get off get of it until I start getting those patriot mythology guys. Uh, Art Pat called me once and he said, You know, I turned on your show the other day and I heard my two favorite people on the earth. On the radio at the same time, you and Ralph Winry, Ralph Winry is a researcher out of Alaska. I said, oh, you heard that, huh? Yeah, I did. You were crawling down Ralph's throat. Yeah, that was what that was. There's a jackass. He told everybody that the statutes don't apply. The Constitution doesn't apply. Well, what applies, Ralph? Oh, you got you to gotta go to the National Register. Well, it's really nice, Ralph. The National Register is about 65,000 pages. You want to be a little more specific? Oh, well, well you, you just have to go to the National Register. So don't call into my show telling people that the statutes don't apply. It looks like. And that cop out there with a gun, he thinks it applies, and that judge thinks it applies, and when you throw your butt in jail, it's going to feel like it applies. Mm-hmm. Hey, look up for me. He never has called back into my show. Wow. He was right. Technically, he was right. It is the, <clears throat> the public laws of the National Register that apply. But to the degree that the published statutory code accurately reflects the public law, it applies. And he's telling them it don't. I think all over the country get people out of jail for following these idiots' prescriptions. I just talked to Art Pat today. Ed Waller is leading that son of a bitch in North Carolina. He's helping some doctor with uh, IRS issues. Uh, he had somebody helping him. They were doing just fine. Ed Waller convinced him to do some of his patriot mythology crap two days ago. The doctor said to you, you got five years in prison over income tax. This should have never happened. I want to cramp Ned Water, choke him to his eyes, bug out, bragging about beating the IRS. They had enough, not the IRS, the, uh, the, the feds. The feds came after him. They're going to put him in prison for 160 years and beat him off. I should Ralph, well, well, I'll talk about this on the other side. He lost everything, lost his family, lost his house, lost his jobs, living in a mobile home, but he won. You dumbass, you may beat the time, but you won't beat the wide. Okay, man. Come on back in. <laughs> Okay, we are back. Randy Kelton, Brett Fountain, Wheel of Law Radio, and we're talking to Miss Tina in California. Okay. Uh, I, I was saying that, that Tina filed a, a bar grievance, and the bar just trashed it. And so she's doing some creative stuff she filed with the Supreme Court. Will you explain the rest of that, Tina? Yes, I, I filed um, a verified complaint as the Supreme Court requested, because first I just got paid. Okay, wait, wait, hold on, Tina. Back up to you filed 
against the lawyer, against the the bar association the with the Supreme law. because yeah. they didn't act on your, your complaint with the lawyer. Bring everybody up to speed on that. Yeah, and uh, first of all, they said they didn't get it. Um, you know, three months after I mailed it, priority mail with tracking, I hadn't heard anything. And Randy and everyone said, oh, it takes time, it takes time. But, you know, three or four months later, I said, now I'm going to call and find out. They claimed they never got it. I said, well, you did because it was delivered at 2.46 p.m. on January the 7th of 2019. I have the receipt here. Uh, well, we don't have it. And the, the lady, you know, the clerk, she was very, very nice, and she said, uh, well, you can resubmit it. I said, I don't want to resubmit 10 full copies of this. That's an expense that I can't afford. Oh, just, just send one copy to us. So I did. She was extremely helpful, um, even calling me when I was back in England to make sure that I'd got it and that I would get this done and send it to the right place and blah, blah. Uh, so I did that. Sent them another one, certified mail, made sure they got it, and I emailed it to them. And uh, I was told that then I then had to write, um, you know, a, a petition for uh, relief of default because it was late. And uh, my petition was late because I should have done it, you know, months ago. So I wrote a very detailed, you know, uh, thing because she said, include everything. I said, everything, including the fact that the DA's office in L.A. told me that I was basically pissing in the wind, and that's a statement from them. And she sort of took a breath and she said, put everything in. So I did, including that statement. And they finally accepted it. But then they immediately dismissed it and or denied it. No explanation. They just denied it. Yes. This is when we got creative. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> So he had uh, suggested I write and ask um, for the names of the clerks because the judges always give the clerks this um, responsibility to research the law. And okay, okay, hold, hold on a second. Let me explain this a little bit. The judges are real busy. Uh, all of these, every Supreme Court in every state and the U.S. Supreme has clerks that do their legal research for them and prepare their briefs and such because they got too much to do. They don't have time to do all of that. So Tina sends this to the Supreme and it gets denied immediately. So what we're saying is, is that the judges fail to perform their duty to properly apply the law to the facts and by failing to do so, they denied her in due process. But how do we prove that? Well, first thing we do is find out who the clerks are who did the research for the judges so they could make their determination. We don't think there were any. So when she puts in the request and doesn't get a response to it, then that creates the adverse inference that they didn't use any clerk and they clerks and they did not properly consider her petition and thereby denied her in due process. And then we'll file criminally against the each member of the Supreme. Okay, go ahead. Randy. Tina. You forgot something you, you that you could forgot that you got even more creative and that you suggested that I had someone not related to the case yes. um, make the request so that they wouldn't know why we were requesting it. Yes. And that's what back, I did. back to my idea, my thing on ringers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But they have not had any response. And I clearly, I, I purposely did not put their telephone number in there. Um, just their mailing address, and I, I requested that all correspondence be in writing. So do I request myself now, or what do we do next? Because No, no, you don't need to request. You just need the request this other person sent. Okay, now we have non-response. Mm -hmm. There's two things to look at. There's the Open Records Act. 
and then there is public records. These are public records because they're court records, and that comes under Constitution. And we need some case law that tells the clerk how long she has to re respond to a request for public information. Okay. And because, uh, you know, they do that to me in Texas all the time. If you ask for something from the court under open records, they're going to say you can't get it because it's under public records. If you ask for it under public records, oh, well, these records uh, fall under the Open Records Act, so you can't get it under public records. So well, I'm going to stop to that real quick. I got a little bitty paragraph that I put at the beginning of my records request, and I said, I don't care if you construe this as Government Code 552 or if you construe this as Judicial Rule 12 or if you just construe this as common law right of access. I'm we the people, and I want to see the records now. Good, good. I don't put anything. I say I want to see these records. I don't have any duty to give them legal advice. So I don't include any statutory references at all. I just ask for the records. So that's asking for the records, and it invokes any requirement that may exist. So it's, it's a thing a lot of pro se's feel like they have to cite the law in order to enact the law. No, no, no. The law applies whether you cite it or not. So that's it. I've got some on uh, jurisimprudence.website. I'm a blank section. Uh, I've got some blank requests in there, and they don't sta state any statute at all. But anyway, okay. Go ahead, uh, go Tina. Next? Where do we go we keep... next with this particular thing? Okay. Uh, next step. How long what has it been? I would give them uh, what is the what is the requirement in California under the Open Records Act or the Open Government Law? Uh, How much time do they have? Sure off the top of my head. So whatever it is, look that up and give this court the same amount of time. And after that amount of time, have this person file criminal charges against each of the uh, justices of the Supreme for. Uh, denying you in public records, due process violation. It doesn't matter if it's under open records or under public courts. You have a right to these records. They denied you in that right. That's a due process violation. California has a official misconduct statute. I can't quote it off the top of my head, but I've read it. And it reflects 18 U.S. Code 242. So that will bind them. So charge them okay. for denying you in due process. Um, and we remember we still have the same thing with the state bar where they have said, I'm not entitled to see the response the attorney made to my complaint against him. It's private sealed and is not available for anyone to see. And you had suggested he'd invited me to call him. You suggest that I uh, write to the Supreme Court asking them to clarify that this, that I am a party to this, not just a member of the public. And uh, there's a very, I, I wanted to tell you guys this, there's a very interesting um, uh, document that I came across uh, that someone sent me very recently that I think you will like. Okay, wait. Hang on. About to go to break. Oh, Randy. Don't pull up. Randy Kelton. Randy Kelton. Brett Fountain. Rule of Law Radio. Uh, I'm not going to give out the call-in number. We're going to our last segment. We'll be right back. I got. A, I got a question, real quick. <clears throat> okay. With with the uh, open records request, uh, how you said you know you don't put nothing on that, and he'll put the uh, that paragraph on there. Which is uh, more likely to work to receive the open records uh, right away rather than having to go through the whole legal system to get it? Neither one of those would make you forget that. 
So this is going to give the record you're not. Okay. Well, open the record on what your purpose is. Your purpose is to get them in trouble because they're willing to step across your legal lines and you're wanting them to be accountable to that. Then you don't give them any, um, like what Randy was saying, just leave it out completely. And then they'll assume that it's public records and they'll give you excuses about that. But if you are really wanting the records and you don't want to have one more front to fight on because you're trying to focus elsewhere, mm -hmm. well then I've found that, well at least for me in my situation, is I've found that to put that little blurb on there makes it to where they realize they don't really have any excuses and so they better just produce the records. And they do. They don't give me any flag for that. Yeah, let me, let me interject. Putting that blurb on there is great. <laughs> I started to put that kind of thing in. Give me down to this or this or anything else that applies. Mm -hmm. And then it decided just to leave it out altogether. But having that in there, it does put them on notice. So does that include body cam footage and dash cam footage? Oh, yeah. You can get, yeah, whatever <clears throat> security cams that caught you anywhere that you, you were seen. Uh, what if what if, what if it was uh, an officer sh involved shooting? Definitely, sir. none of that makes any difference. Okay. Try to, they will try to restrict it based on ongoing. Is there an ongoing uh, investigation or prosecution? Yeah. Okay. Hang on. Hang on. Hang on. We got to go back in. Okay. Okay, we are back. Randy Kelton, Brett Fountain, Wheel of Law Radio, and we're talking to Tina in California. Okay, Tina, go ahead. Yeah, I was in, I, I got this uh, document, and I would like to send it to you so you can post it on your website, because I know, I can't ever remember Ted's name up north, uh, and I want to send him a couple of things, so remember to send me his email. I've got it, but I can't pull it up for some reason because my memory's gone. Uh, but this is a California state auditor who's still currently in the position, and this is a 2015 audit, and it says, State Bar of California. It has not consistently protected the public through its attorney discipline process and lacks accountability. Oh, that gives me an idea. I thought I would send my complaints to... How, how about sending the state bar a tort letter? Okay. How do you do a tort letter? A uh, tort letter is... The courts do not want you to use the court as a remedy of first resort. They want you to use the courts as a remedy of last resort. So they require you to exercise your administrative remedies before coming to the court. But the only requirement they ask for in terms of exhausting administrative remedy is notice and opportunity. Mm -hmm. And that's in, in UCC, notice and opportunity. You notice them have, that you have been harmed and give them opportunity to repair the harm so that you don't have to sue. You guys have failed to fulfill the, the requirements of your charter and have shielded these lawyers from the consequences of their bad behavior. And because of that, the lawyer cheated me out of all of this money and failed to properly adjudicate my case because he felt protected by you, so you sue them for three times the value of the property that you lost. Notice, notice them that you've been harmed in this amount, and in three as three times the amount of the property, and state make me whole or be sued. That's okay. the notice they need. Okay. And now, now they have their notice, and you know, when, once you tell them you're going to sue them, then win, lose, or draw is going to cost them a lot of money. It's going to be even more difficult for them because you already know how to file bar grievances. That's why you're 
dealing with the bar. So when they hire an attorney to represent them, you're going to bar grieve the attorney into the Stone Age, and they know that. You're going to cost them a lot of money. So their attorneys are going to tell them, you need to do something to mitigate our loss. And the best way they can mitigate their loss is say, oh, my goodness, we made a mistake. We should have hammered this guy in the first place. Mm-hmm. Throw, throw the lawyer under the bus and get you off their case. Well, you mentioned earlier you were saying that um, some is either another call or this call uh, where um, if a crime you have knowledge of a crime being committed, it is your duty to report it. Well, there was a crime committed when the attorney refused to allow the notaries in Texas to send me their notary ledgers. That is a felony because you're encouraging and coercing two public officials to break the law. That's criminal conspiracy to commit. Yes, isn't it? He plus it plus was, whatever law they were, he was encouraging them to violate. Well, it's clear in Texas and California that they are required to send it once it's requested and they've given the person the amount they need to send in to pay for these records, which they never did, and then I'm entitled to them in 30 days. And he said it's improper discovery. No, it's a private right of action. It's not about discovery. Anyone can request these. And if there's anyone out there in Texas who would like to help me try to request these again that are in Texas, and I would love to speak with them um, because... You know, I need a little help trying to go after the Texas side of this. Uh, but that's a felony, and I'm required to report it. Do I put that in there? And they failed to act upon this report of a crime. Okay, this is a, a, a little more complex. We're running out of time. Call me okay. tomorrow, and I'll address this with you. Okay, I will do that. But before we run out of time, I want to tell people, I I did, I went uh, on my current declaratory judgment thing, I went to see an attorney for the free senior legal aid. And she's very, very helpful, same one as helped me last time. And she gave me a printout of a document that (coughs) would... uh, Okay, Okay. be careful with attorneys. I hate to have to say this, but... The only thing the attorney wants from you is a retainer. Oh, no, no, and they're no. Gonna, this is free. This is and they're going to they're gonna tell you anything that you want to hear to get a retainer out of you, they're going to throw you under the bus. This is free. It's all free. Oh, free. Okay. That, it's free legal aid for seniors. Okay, good. I'm having a little trouble understanding you're getting that you, you, you constantly have a bit of a distortion and I'm having, having a little more trouble than usual today. Yeah, but she gave me this document that I think would help a lot of people. I haven't fully read it, but she pointed out some things that I need to include in my declaratory judgment response. It's called reaching out or overreaching judicial ethics and self-represented litigants. It's quite a long lengthy document that I will send to you so you can post it. Yes, yeah, send it send it to me. I'm familiar with overreaching, but generally overreaching is pretty focused in its application. Send it to me. I'd like to read it. I will. And but there was one comment she made. She she gave me quite a lot of help and she told me to use ninth circuit cases, not federal, not this and this circuit. Use the strongest one. She printed out some stuff for me. But she had one comment that disturbed me, Um, and I kind of got around it. Remember I said in the California Constitution, which most people in California don't know there is one, uh, and I've never read it, um, it talks about the uh, statute should be liberally construed if it helps the people um, and um, narrowly construed if it doesn't. And I had put that in my response, and she said, you know, she was reading it quickly, and she said, oh, take this claptrap out. You can't put Constitution stuff in there. And I said, well, 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 wait a minute. She said, well, the judges throw that, they hate it. And I said, this is a specific part of the statute that 
you know, relates to this statute. And she read it again, and then she said, okay, but you got it in the wrong place. Well, I, I see where you're going. But she said, judges hate this constitutional stuff. What is it about the Constitution of the United States or each state that judges hate? Isn't that what Okay, the okay. Is? They do hate constitutional stuff. And I you know, always suggest never quote Constitution. Always quote the case law that supports the constitutional restriction. But okay. you don't care what they like or not. No. At the end of the day, you're holding them responsible for properly applying the law to the facts. Uh, lawyers care what judges like and don't like. Pro se should not care. Yeah. She did suggest, which is a good suggestion, that I put it in a footnote, and she even showed me how to do a footnote. And I said, do they judges really read this? She said, oh, yes, they read them. She said, sometimes the juiciest stuff is in the footnote. Interesting. Which I thought was interesting. Yes. Oh, I would very much like to see this document. Send it to me. It to and, so you can uh, it for everyone to look at. Yeah, we're about to run out of time here. Uh, yeah, you but get on to someone else and I'll call you tomorrow. Okay. Thank you, Tina. Okay. If it's Dre uh, or uh, Chief, did you have a couple of any final comments? Uh, I think we need, we need to come back on next week or tomorrow, whenever it is. I think we still have a lot to talk about. Okay, we will do it. The next show will be Thursday. We do a show Thursday and Friday nights. Friday nights are much better because they're much longer where you can go in depth. Yeah, I do like the, the Friday shows. Uh, we kind of inherited the extra two hours a number of years ago when a broadcaster didn't show up for the shows. So we just extended ours to fill in that time. And finally, we just dumped him and took over the time. And it's turned out to be really good because we can go into issues in a lot more depth, which you won't find. You know, most shows don't have time to do that. And uh, we have a really good listenership. And, and Shane and John, I'm sorry I didn't get to you. If you will email me, I'll address your issues off the air. But uh, we've had some really good guests on. This has been a great show. And, you know, it's, Brett will, will attest that there's nothing like examining an issue in deeper detail. You get a lot better grasp and understanding of what's going on. And, and Chief, I hope you've got from this that we have a depth of information here. Yes. Yeah, we didn't just start this yesterday. This ain't our first rodeo. And we can get these past these guys past that front end portion where they they were having problems. And if if these guys, you know, like Stray with his dedication, they will wind these guys clocks. And it just doesn't take many. Brett, you've seen that. We start hammering these guys, they start changing their policies really fast. And it doesn't take a bunch of guys hammering them, just one or two. So uh, I'm real, I'm excited about this. I finally find the guys I've needed. And thank you, you two, for being on. And we'll talk off the air and set up something for our, our upcoming shows. Thank you all for listening. We'll be back next week. Same time, same station. Thank you and good night. Okay, I would like to get the kinds of issues that are relevant to you guys. We, we, at, we listen to this, you can tell we've got lots of stuff we do. We do, and, uh, I, I've helped over 700 people file lawsuits in foreclosure cases. So we do foreclosure, we do all kinds of stuff. For the time being, I want to focus a few shows on what would be relevant to cop block and First Amendment audits so that we can get these guys cranked up and energized. For sure. So, Stray, before we talk next time, see if you can get 
putting together a set of talking points. Okay. Things you think you'd like to address. It's hard to do that, you know, when we're in the heat of things on the air. Just freestyling on there. Do what? I said when we're we're just freestyling on there. Yeah, I, I don't like freestyling as much. Uh, I've, I've been struggling here because I have people who have been waiting to ask questions, and I needed to kind of get to them, but I. I really wanted to to go through what the people who are doing these audits need because I'm watching these guys and uh, these guys are lying, reminding me of standing on that jeep begging those uh, daring those guys to shoot me off of it. They're kind of doing the same thing. I want to get them off the front of that jeep <laughs> and, and get them digging down, get them more serious. Uh, I'm sure we won't get all of them because a lot of them are just out there to excise their demons. But we got a bunch of people out there who actually want to change things. And so think about it. Think about the, the issues that you can foresee that you don't really know how to address. Okay. And get, get us a, a list of as much of that as you can. And we and Brett to get together and put together some presentations on how to handle these. And we try to demonstrate this in a, in a way that, that keeps it lighthearted. That's the best part. That's the worst thing to do is get, let this get too serious. And it's especially good. Because when he's trying to manipulate you into doing something stupid and you're laughing and joking with him instead it really puts him off his game unless he's a pro and you know doesn't have these issues and doesn't bother him at all it's only the guys with attitude that he bothers and then uh, we're hoping we can adjust those attitudes absolutely we really don't want to be rid of these cops it costs too much to train them and uh, <laughs> My experience is most of them are really good guys at heart. They're just trained wrong. They follow the policy, even if the policy <clears throat> breaks the law. Could yeah. you could you hold the academies accountable? Because they're supposed to Absolutely. know this stuff. Man, that's, yeah. more, if yeah. that's more long range. You want to yeah. develop a lawsuit against the academies. Well, I, I've, I've read several times the uh, laws of arrest, you know, as far as it uh, pertains to New Mexico. And I've even uh, made a video of that. And it seems since day one, they're supposed to know you need reasonable, articulable suspicion of a crime. And they seem to completely have forgotten that. Yeah, well, what we do is we just walk them right down due process. They've got all this due process, and then they've got these policies. So we don't care about policy, we only care about due process. Exactly. So we walk them down due process, and the thing that will be the most effective is where we sting the guy for following policy. You know, I mentioned suing Denton County for $11 million. I sued 24 litigants. I sue every one of them for following policy. Wow. Except for one. I sued my worst nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> the, one, the one who told me he was my worst nightmare. Nobody would tell me who he was, so when I sued, I included my worst nightmare. <laughs> and I had the transcripts where the county commissioner's court assigned the district attorney to defend the case. And the judge said to the prosecutor, Who is this my worst nightmare? <laughs> and the prosecutor said, well, apparently someone introduced himself to Mr. Kelton as his worst nightmare. Yeah. And the judge said, yes, and I have a bone to pick with him. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was fun. And that was where I got an officer to just act ignorant. And, and never, uh, you know, I didn't do anything officer because nobody would tell me who he was. But as I understand, 
two days after I filed the lawsuit, he was fired. Now, I didn't like that. I didn't want to get him fired. I just wanted to embarrass him. Mm -hmm. And get him to change his behavior. Yeah, you need not to do that anymore. Mm -hmm. and, and they make better cops. Chief, is there any mistake that you made that didn't make you a better cop? I'd have to think hard that's a lot of years. I mean, I, I think, <laughs> me personally, every time what we were taught was to say error. We didn't make mistakes, we made error. Because that was a legal term and you had a right to correct your error. So, you know, any so-called errors I may have made in hindsight, I said, wow, I don't want to go down that road again. Never again. And I would go get legal advice from the state attorney who could give us advice. And I talk to the city attorney or the county attorney and say, if this circumstance presents, oh, that's very unlikely. Well, it actually already has happened. So it may happen again. Well, what did you do? Da 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 da. Well, you should have done this. I said, that's what I'm asking you. You're, you're playing semantics with me. I'm telling you that this is what actually happened, and, and, you know, maybe it should be this way or that way. He said, oh, no, that's all wrong. And I said, so what, what do you suggest? He said, well, I'm not going to suggest anything. He said, I'm going to tell you the law says this, and it's been interpreted by the court to mean this. And I said, where am I going to find that? So he said, a few cases, uh, and I went to the law library and looked them up, read them, brought them back to him, and I said, you said this, but this is not actually what this court decision said. This is way closer to what I said, what I did, than what you said. I mean, my God, you know, have you been telling us this for a while? Oh, we've been coming across this forever. I tell people, when the other side cites cases, read them. Ben Drum, IRS, Dallas, they filed a motion and I don't see a little case law. I said, Ben, did you read their case law? He said, no. I said, read it. He reads it, calls me back laughing. He said, you are not going to believe this. They cited two sections out of these, this case law. And both of them were examples of how the law was before this case changed it. So these guys looked at the key words and read the key phrases and didn't read the whole case. Right. So, so Ben went back into court with their cases and crammed them up their ass. First time I ever had a guy get an IRS lead dropped. Uh, another judge put him back on later. But this judge was so furious at these lawyers giving him bad law that they dropped the case. That, that they grand drop the, uh, the IRS lien. The worst thing a lawyer can do is file bad case law. I'm sorry, second worst. The worst thing you can do is not know. That is absolutely the worst. He is learned counsel. Now, you and I, we're just ignorant old pro saints. We can screw up all we want to judge and get annoyed at us. But we're just pro saints. What the hell? Lawyers, they get that bar card. They become learned counsel. They can't miss things. I've got a book on the psychology of the law. It's called The Soul of the Law. The guy was a, psychi was a lawyer first and then became a psychiatrist. He only treated lawyers because they were all paranoid. None of them ever got better. And he said about, you know, when he was to start law, and they sent him to this client, and he's learning counsel. He cannot not have an answer. So he developed this uh, imposter syndrome. He said all lawyers have it. They know they don't know shit. But they always got to act like they know everything. And they're always afraid they're going to get found out. 
I had a lawyer tell me that I couldn't act as a paralegal for a private citizen once, and she's going in for a ticket. And I said, where'd you come up with that? Did you just make that up? And he looked like I had slapped him because he realized he didn't have any case law to back that up. He just popped his mouth off over what he said he knew, and I asked him to back it up, and he didn't know. That was the worst thing to do to a lawyer. So a citizen can, can go in and defend someone in court? They tend not to let you know. I never tried to defend anyone in court, but the, the Constitution says you have the right to counsel of your choice. It doesn't say lawyer of your choice. It doesn't say it's bar counsel. member. <laughs> right. It doesn't right. tell them. But the judges <clears> try <throat> to enforce that. Uh, I've had people have judges tell them that they have to get a lawyer. And the judge has never done that to me. Hmm. I would be glad for him to tell me that, because I'd ask the bailiff to arrest him immediately. Well, is a is a is a pro se litigant uh, considered an officer of the court? No, no. And that's good. They're all the officers of the court are public servants. You are the master of those servants. Uh huh. When you walk into the courthouse, you got two hats. You walk in the courthouse with your litigant's hat on. But if one of your public officials steps half inch across, take off that litigant's hat, you put on that master's hat, and say, boys, we're going to fight. <laughs> you ain't going to like it. <laughs> the first time you call 911, things will change. If you get the opportunity this week, go do an audit somewhere. Well, federal courthouse is great. Go do the federal courthouse and get these idiot U.S. Marshals. These U.S. Marshals are not in the federal courthouse by mistake. They're in the federal courthouse because they're not fit to operate out on the streets. And they put them in a the courthouse to get them out of the way because you can't fire them. So they're not the sharpest knives in the drawer. And they think they have authority. But when they step out the door of that courthouse, they step out into this state. Fractions are already in this state. Because the courthouse does not belong to the federal government. It belongs to the state. The federal government's just leased it. The only place where the feds have exclusive authority are properties that have been ceded to the federal government. And generally that's uh, federal prisons and some uh, international port, ports. Uh, remember the movie The Presidio? Uh, I've heard, I, I, I know of it. I'm not sure I've seen it. Okay, this was about a, a Marine that was killed on the Presidio Marine Base. And a local sheriff come in and investigated that, not the Marines. That's because that base is in this state. And they fall under the, the common law, the penal code of this state. The federal courthouse, same way. Mm. But when they step out of that courthouse, they don't have any clue. They don't have any authority outside that courthouse. They think they do. And if we can go to them to act like they do, then you call the, the best is to call the local sheriff and ask him to come out and arrest him. Because the sheriff is the highest law enforcement official in the county. That's not going to make these U.S. Marshals happy. And the upside to that is, is federal officials are really arrogant jackasses. And local police tend not to get along with them very well because the local police treat them like errant stepchilds. Mm. So when you call the local police out to arrest the U.S. Marshals, they're, they're not always so far against that. But well, I'll, you, <coughs> you were talking about the Academy and the first Academy I went to 
there was a, I guess he was like a program director who just made sure they dotted the I's across the T's, scheduled people to be in, but he had worked in law enforcement, uh, I think in the late 60s through the mid 70s when he got a job at a police academy because he thought he could do far better instructing because he was real level headed. He was slightly anal retentive, slightly, but that was to, I guess to keep all his facts and his mind rolling around. He said, I want to tell you something. He said, the man that's supposed to be here teaching this course is running about 30 minutes late, but I can't let you out of the class because of the curriculum requirements. But I can have discretion over 10% of the class, so here we go. He says, look in your panel code at the beginning. He said, please note that it says copyrighted. He said, so you're using copyrighted law. He said, copyrighted law is edited from the actual legislative acts. He said, you go to the Secretary of State's office and look up a particular law and put it against what's in that book, it's going to be different because the law cannot be copyrighted. So he said they found another way to do it. They changed a few words here and there, but those words are very important. He says, now, go in here in the book to this where it says, who is an actor. He said, just like a play or a movie, it's actors. We're filling a fictional role. Like we're in a movie, we're actors. You got good actors and bad actors. There ain't no other kind of actor. So we're carrying out a novel that is copyrighted. And he said, most people ain't smart enough to realize this. And he said, but have to pay royalties for using copyrighted material, but do you think the West Publishing or whoever charges the police departments and the governments for doing this? No. He says, because we get hundreds of thousands of law books published from them every year, every other year, and they want to not run into any problem with the government. So they just like to make sales. But in reality, they're due a copyright fee for every time somebody's arrested or a ticket is written on their copyrighted law. So every single criminal case, citation, notice to appear, it all has a critical mass fee. So everything you're actually doing out of that book is 100% totally legal. He says, now, Probably, you know, a few of the very smartest lawyers in this state probably know this from back in the 40s and 50s, but they're dying off and said, these new lawyers are not taught real arguments. They're taught case law. So all they know is the case law, they're not actually studying the actual law. He says, now that's the difference in people like Richard Racehorse Haynes in Fort Worth and certain other well-known attorneys, maybe Death Lee Bailey and, you know, a few others that know this stuff inside out. They know procedural errors, structural errors, uh, copyright violations, etc. And they know all the motions. There's a book of motions. But it doesn't have to come out of that book. An attorney saw a motion not in that book, they asked the judge to drop it because it's not in this book of motion. He said, the judge doesn't have to do that. He, he said, so you need to learn what your role in this play is, because if you step outside of this book, outside of this fairy tale novel, things get real ugly real fast. Your career can end, you can lose everything you work for, ever hope to have, and you can be in a cage that has been attention told when to get up, when to go to bed. It's like kind of like being in the military, except you get a criminal attachment for life, and you'll and you'll never be able to do anything good again. So know who you are, know the law, know what you're pretending to enforce under color of law, because we don't have the law. We no longer have law. We only have color of law. So. I learned a lot from that man and on breaks. I'd always
we go find him and ask him questions. It's a, you're going to make one of the best cops this state has ever turned out. You're going to be a real peace officer. Mm-hmm. And he said, under the common law, and he said, you're, you're filling a fictional position as a law enforcement officer or peace officer. He said, but you're trying to act under the common law. And he says, but they're forcing you to use statutory law, even when it's repugnant to the Constitution. And he said, so every judge around here is going to act like that's the Bible, but it's really not. He said, so if you ever get in a real, real tie, remember what I said, and you file your own motions. And uh, he, he taught me a lot of things. This is, so, I mentioned earlier, Ralph Renerud out of Alaska. Yes, sir. This is what he was saying. He was saying, don't pay any attention to the statutory codified code. The real law is the public law in the National Register. Uh, but only that's only applicable to the degree that the statutory language does not accurately reflect the intent of the uh, public law. 99.5% of them do accurately reflect, but there are a few that do not. And one of one of my studies I haven't gotten to is comparing the, the to the law. I have a AI guy, AI database guy in North Carolina. And I'm glad you mentioned this. I'll put it on my notes. I'm going to ask him to run an algorithm on the codes so that I match the codes to the public laws so that I'll have a compendium of the public laws and then I can do a hover and it will pop up the uh, I have a compendium of the code, compendium of the code, and then I hover over the code, and it will pop up the public law from which it comes, so we can do direct comparisons. We have some other tools like that we're working on, and that one should be fairly straightforward and it'll be in line with some of the other things we're doing. He's already pulled out all the federal codes and scraped them. There are 50,000 words and phrases right at 50,000 in all of the U.S. codes. 50,000 individual terms. And now he's running algorithms on them to find all of the places in the codes where a term is defined within a section, a chapter, a title. So that when you come to this term, you can hover over it and it will give you the definition within this code first and the scope of the definition as defined in the code. And then it will, if it doesn't find a definition within this code, then it will back out by chapter and section and paragraph and back out of that looking for definitions and give you all the definitions that it it finds, the scope of those definitions, it'll back out to Black's Law to, uh, what's the one from 1896? (sighs) I'll think of the French name. I'll think of it in a minute. Volumes. Do what? Volumes. Yes, yes, exactly. Volumes, 1896. And then from that, it will go to the, the common law definitions. So that you can look at a term and tell by where you find it what the definition should be. And that will be a, a legalese lexicon. And it will, with that same technology, it will be simple enough to take all of the codified statutes and extract their corresponding public laws because they're all referenced in those codes anyway. And then we can pop those up together and it'd be easy to make those comparisons. Well, let me tell you, I got a friend in New Jersey, and I thought he was cracking up to start with. 
or he was in some kind of Patriot theory that was unchallenged or whatever. But he said, oh, no, I got to ask for more papers and IRS papers. I'll send them to you. And he did. He, uh, he was constantly getting a ticket or getting wrote up for no driver's license. And he, he said, you know, they put me in my car in jail. They got military police up here the way they act. I said, yes, I know about New Jersey police. He said, anyway, to make the long, the long story short, he said, uh, I do not have a birth certificate. He said, my mother knew better when they come and brought her the papers to sign in and they had my footprints on there and all that other stuff. She said, I'm feeling kind of bad for a moment here. So just come back in a minute and I'll have it. So she took that form and put it in her purse. And so she said, uh, I'm feeling much better now. I'm going to leave. They said, you haven't been discharged. She said, I'm discharging myself. She said, have a good day. They said, well, where's the, uh, whatever. She had her baby. She said, We're, uh, we'll get back with you. They left the hospital without doing that. He never, they never filed for him a social security number. He went to work at a restaurant when he was 18. They said, you got to have a social security number. He says, no, look up the law. you got to request it, but I don't have to get it. I don't have to get one. That's a myth. So then he got tickets. And so they're trying. They can't even find him in the system. And and eventually, so we went through this at least three times in one particular borough, whatever they call it there. So he had a friend of his that worked in the IRS. Law Enforcement Division, okay, International Monetary Fund. He told his friends, that how can they crook this stuff? He said, they're not paying no taxes on these seizures. He said, well, if you fill out a Form 56 for a criminal IRS investigation, he said, uh, 40, we'll take care of it. So he filled this out. He knew all the correct numbers and codes, what he did, and his friend gave him. So he sent it down there. They sent IRS people up to that city, to their court, and told them that they had so many millions of dollars of fines that were considered a uh, profit, a profit to the city, and therefore was taxable. And they committed criminal acts of treason by not paying their taxes. They had a man with standing that had had his, his wealth taken from him. So they closed the court down. And they put IRS things on the front door that said court is suspended. And so that city had to make some sort of settlement arrangement. And it took six or eight weeks to do it. And so they made them dismiss his case. Or they wasn't going to have court no more. So the police there never talked to him. If they see him, they go the opposite direction. And he said, word got around. He said, pretty soon I've gone all over different counties around here and everybody knew me. And I, I still kind of thought maybe he was making some of this up, but it took me days and days to go over all this paperwork. And I said, crap, this backs up his testimony. He's one of the most incredible people that's fought the system and won. But I don't go around telling people because I don't want them to do it because they don't know what they're doing. Yeah, that's I've got guys who can help you handle the IRS. You should never have to pay anything in the IRS. i got guys... What, what both of these, you know, David uh, David Lewis and uh, Barry Watson, they both say the same thing. Never fight with the IRS. Give the IRS what they need, and the agent will gladly sign off for you. No matter what it is, you get this guy your stuff, you'll never pay income tax. And you won't have the IRS bother you. It's easy enough to, to not have to pay the IRS. You just got to give them the right documents. Yeah, I'd like to learn that. Well, I can get you in front of in, in contact with David Lewis. He's an ex jarhead. Uh, I tell everybody he's an asshole, and uh, he tells everybody that I overestimate him. <laughs> uh, anyway, you're you're like David. He's he's good people. Yes, sir. 
<laughs> he was. They had to quit drinking. Yeah. And they used to go to pool tournaments. When you had to get quit drinking, you couldn't play pool anymore. Wow. He was a Marine, uh, ex Marine pilot. Interesting guy. He's yeah. down in Austin. Fantastic. I got, I got a bunch of people I can connect you with for most, most legal stuff. You know, I only handle a couple of things. Right. I want to go on one of those speaking tours. I almost got to go on one one time on the speaking circuit, you know? Yeah, I had thought about doing seminars. I like doing seminars. I, I, I went to, flew, went to uh, Australia and did some seminars down there. And Australia was really interesting. But got some stuff. I've got some tools I'd like to give away one. Seven years old. I may run out of time here. And I would like to get this out, especially what I'm doing right now. There's, there's a lot of depth to it. And I'd like to get some people trained in it. I'd like to see the cops learn this. Well, I want to be a sponge and suck up everything you can get me. And here's the deal. I got people between... 60 on the light side, and most of them are 70 to 86 years old that have been studying the law since at least the mid 90s or before. Some of them since the 70s. They're engineers, some of them are doctors, lawyers, and they've been feeding me information since 2013. And I damn near had a nervous breakdown trying to keep up with everything. And and I, I said, God, this is just overwhelming. He said, No, you ask for wisdom and knowledge. I said, Yes, sir. He said, And I, once you look inside the honeycomb, you can't not see what you've seen. Yeah. And I thought this was going to be very difficult. You could do it, but it'd be very difficult. He said, Take a rest. I mm-hmm. took a off, spent time in bed, and I've charged up, and I've been going ever since. What you got to do is focus. Yes, sir. You're not, we, we don't, none of us have enough space to burn all of it. All right. You got to focus. Uh, what I'm working on behind all of this is we've developed a technology whereby we can capture the entire knowledge base of the planet and deliver it to a layperson in a way that they can extract from the knowledge base just that information that they need. That's, the Legal Earth is, is the biggest, did, did I give you the Legal Earth website? I uh, so. Okay, Legal Earth is the <coughs> real project, um, but it's only focused on law. The underlying technology is applicable to everything, but we went to law first, or I did, and that's, I've been 12 years developing this. I went to legal, went to law first because the legal, the legal parameters are finite. We know what all the law is because we made it up. And I'm using law to develop the technology. <clears throat> Give me any lawyer. I set him down and will extract his entire expertise. Deliver it back to a novice in the form of an online interactive questionnaire. Right. And then take another expert in the same subject and add his expertise to it. And before long, we will have the entire knowledge base. Um, I'm doing this in law because the variables are finite. All of the legal elements are specifically defined. And it's teaching us, mainly we're teaching an engine how to read code, understand code, and convert the code into this matrix questionnaire. Once we can get it to read statutory code, then we'll back out from that into less finite areas like uh, medicine. 
I used to read Scientific American, and, and I like to read the obscure diagnoses. They had a section where doctors would talk about really obscure diagnoses that they did. And every single time, the diagnosis was made because of some serendipitous occurrence. They were at this seminar one year before that happened to address this exact issue. Or they had a friend who researched in exactly this issue. A general, ordinary doctor who didn't happen to have that unique experience would have never diagnosed it. And I said, wait a minute. We need a way to fix this. When the guy does the diagnosis, he walks down a set pattern of questions. He asks himself these questions, and depending on how he answers the question, it'll take him to the next issue. But with some of these things, they're so complex, he gets to a spot where he doesn't have the next question. Uh, what we don't have is a fixed structure. So he can always walk exactly to this place. And if somebody says, well, wait a minute, I was at this, this symposium, this guy was talking about this issue, and it fit right here, you put that in. Once you put it in, every doctor has access to it. But every time we come up with something, this, what this does is it puts the knowledge base in a logical structure. Now it's not as complicated as it appeared on the on the surface. Law got a whole lot simpler than we expected, and I think the world knowledge base will get a lot more, a lot simpler. I was at a meeting of big data programmers, and they were complaining that the uh, AI had not lived up to its expectation. So I told them I have this tool that uh, will pick any, and it has no intelligence whatsoever. And this one guy said, wait a minute, I'm a lawyer and I take exception to that. And I said, present company included. All this thing knows how to do is connect the dots. So you guys are talking about artificial intelligence not living up to its expectation. But you're speaking of artificial intelligence from a high level of abstraction. What is the organic intelligence that you're trying to artificially emulate? And they all sat there and looked at me like I just stepped off Mars. How do you define the intelligence you're trying to mimic? See, I got this tool that connects dots. And I will reach a place to where I don't have dots to connect. But when I get to that place, I have another tool, just a logical tool that I can extrapolate what those dots should be. So where is that place between separating the dots or, or extrapolating the dots and this thing we call intelligence? I can't find it may be that it's all connected to dots. Yes, sir. If you let, if you let me, I talk to you for four more hours, but I gotta be up and listen. Yeah, me too. I'm, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm exhausted. I'm, I'm sorry. This is this is my subject. Yes, sir. Me, me too. I'm the same okay. way. I can go all night long. Uh, okay. Well, I've <clears> been <throat> up since three this morning. When yeah. you're old, when you're old, you get up early because you gotta go pee. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Thank you, guys, and we'll talk this week. All right. Thanks for the opportunity, Rondo. Appreciate you all so much. You're welcome. Right, everybody. Thank you, dog. I'll send you Bye. those talking points. Yeah, talking. I need talking points. Okay. You have a good night.